Hey guys, welcome out to Revolution this morning. Um, we're going to continue our examination of the history of the Texas Receptus. And so with, um, with our study, really our study is just a bit of a platform um, to get people chatting about the TR and to get people looking at the King James Version, um, issues on textual criticism, um, and things like that. And so this is, um, this is a platform where you can join in. And so if you type in what's on the screen there, if you just go to streamyard.com, and so that's with the HTTPS, um, and you type in this, the H5CBNPTQFB, you can um, jump in and join in the live and you can just um, chat. And so um, it gives you options if you want to use your cam or if you just want to use um, you know, a picture and things like that. And so um, you can jump on and, and chat. We can talk about these things. And so, um, yeah, the format is loose. So we're just going through um, looking at the history of the TR. We've gone through, you know, a few tiny things. We've skipped over a few editions and things like that. But mostly because we, we just want to chat about um, textual issues and um, we, we want to have a good look at um, what's happening with the TR. And so one of the big questions that Mark Ward continually brings up is, you know, which TR? And so, but um, there is, I guess, a little bit of, uh, I wouldn't say division. I would say there's a little bit of a nuance between my position and many other people's um and that is and you can see it on this um on the screen here where i've got um a dartboard and you've got the critical text here um i think you can see my mouse there there we go you've got the critical text here it doesn't even hit the dartboard <laughs> and so then you have the majority text it gets closer but still no dartboard then you have the Complutensian and Polyglot of 1514. It makes the board, but it's still, you know, not in the good range. Uh, then you have Erasmus's text that gets a bit closer. Stephanus's text got closer. Beezer's is very close. His editions, his 1598 is very close. Um, Scrivener is right in the middle of the, uh, the ballpark, but the King James Version is like the dart that just sort of bypasses all these Greek editions and just goes straight bang right in the middle. And so this is one of the areas where it, it can get murky and it can get um, a little bit gray. And because then people are saying, you know, oh, you're a King James only, you know, and obviously the way that King James only has been defined by people the way it's just defined by almost everyone, probably including myself historically, uh, is is just strange. It's it's aloof, and it's almost like the the name Texas Receptus also is a strange sort of like if I was to go up to someone who knew about all these issues and say, okay, so what's the Texas Receptus? And they're like, oh, okay, well that's probably Erasmus's text. But then if you were to ask Jeff Riddle, he'd say, no, it's um, I don't include that in the editions of Texas Receptus. If you were to ask me, I'm like, well, I think the, you know, the final Texas Receptus is this and, you know, and that. And so there's so many different ways of labeling um, different things, Texas Receptus. And so I think um, what the enemies of the TR and King James version do is they, they seem to pit Texas Receptuses against each other as if they're all on the same football team, but they're playing, they're not abiding by the same rules sort of thing. Or, you know, they're, they're, they've kicked a few goals for the opposition. What do you do then? You know, and so trying to put you on the spot and trying to find holes in your argument. And you usually get this really strange, bizarre thing that I, I sort of caught um, Stephen Boyce doing. And I've, I've heard a few other people mention this that I only thought there was one Texas Receptus. I didn't know there was many. As soon as I found out there were many, I thought, my, where's my faith? I can't trust God, and I nearly lost my faith and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, 
Oh, okay. So um, at the beginning of the Texas Receptus, I'll just give you a bit of a, a look at it. So, you know, say someone like Stephen Boyce, he's like, well, we, we thought the blue bound TR was it. That was the TR. The teachers said it was the TR and that's it. But we were shocked to discover that there were, you know, as many as 30 other editions of the TR. Which one do we go with? And some of them differed from the other ones as, as if it's like a big shock. And I think really, you know, uneducated people, I guess people who uh, are coming out of um, seminary and they're basically told, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, bad, Mormons, bad, King James only, bad, and just this really simplistic type of thing where, You've got to demonize KJV people, TR people, because that's just what you've been told to do. And so it must be, they must be um, heretical. It's so weird that if you just believe you have a Bible, you're a heretic. I mean, I would find someone like Bruce Metzger way more heretical than anyone who is on the King James only type of, you know, and see, well, there I go. I'm using King James only as not myself or not you guys as someone like a you know, Ruckmanite or someone who's, you know, um, independent Baptist, um, you know, who sort of, you know, would make a lot of mistakes and lot, um, make a lot of errors, but then say, I'm um, King James only and all this sort of stuff. And so I guess the thing is, these labels being pigeonholed, it, it just doesn't work. And this was one of the things when um, I started doing the debate circuit, um, people just started calling me King James only. And I fought for a long time to get rid of that label. I mean, I, I even strategically um, had groups like exposing Peter Ruckman, you know, like, and I'd have all the, the Ruckmanites come on that group and tell me that I'm a psycho and tell me that, you know, I'm going to hell and I don't evangelize enough and all this. Stuff. It was so weird. And, um, but I, I did discover that Ruckman was very racist and I'm not just saying, you know, woke uh, level of, you know, that's the standard of racist. You know, you're just a white guy. So you're racist. I'm talking about, he was pretty in his books and his writings, he was pretty down on colored people. And so um, it, it was pretty bad. And so that was one of the things we looked at and focused on. And a, a few testimonies came out of people who had been to his congregation and he'd pointed people out from the pulpit. Um, the uh, Mexican couple came in and he started you know, calling them uh, derogatory names, I guess, in, in America. Here we don't have many Mex Mexicans. So he was saying things like spicks. And I guess that's a really bad word to say. I'm Australian, so we didn't have... Um, you know, that type of um, words here. We have a lot of other words. So we, if you said them to me, I'd be offended, but you mightn't be offended in America. So we've got to take that into context. But, um, yeah, and then I, I also started a page exposing Stephen Anderson because I realised that a lot of people who were following my Texas Receptus page where I've got, um, what, 7,300 followers on that one, a lot of them were uh, Andersonites. And so, and at the time I was trying to help a guy who was right into this sort of stuff. And, um, you know, Stephen Anderson's telling people to commit suicide. And, you know, if you've been ever been a homosexual, you, you should just really commit suicide because you can never be saved. You're reprobate and all this. And so I'm trying to stop people from committing suicide. <laughs> it's just, it was just ridiculous. And so, but I looked at all his TR material and it was just your basic bog standard Trinitarian Bible Society stuff. You know, there, there, he did gravitate towards a King James, the, the King James, but he sort of equated Scrivener's text and the King James as one and the same. And so, um, but yeah, so I, I tried to avoid that, the King James only label. And my website is called texasreceptus.com. And so, um, but you just sort of get thrown into that bag. But I think it was actually a blessing. I got thrown into the the bag and I'm like, well, I'm defending the King James. And I'm, I'm like, okay, so what do I think about the King James? I'm like, well, I think the King James is, is accurate. And then it's like, well, I think the Texas Receptus is accurate, but there are some readings in the printed editions of the Texas Receptus that I don't necessarily agree with. I mean, Scrivener got really close, but there's still a few little bits here and there. 
Um, I think the King James is what I would go with. I would probably go with those readings. And then I, I read that quote by um, Edward Hills. And I'd read it before, but not in that context where I'll just throw it up on the screen. Uh, where are we? So we're on my Texas Receptors page. <clears throat> okay. And so I'll just read this out. And so and this is quite amazing too, that this is by Edward Hills. And so Edward Hills is obviously, you know, one of the heroes of um, reformed, you know, Calvinists. Um, and I guess probably people who would sort of balk at this idea that the words of God were found in the, in the KJV, you know. So, but anyway, I'll just read this. Um, so this is in David Cloud's book. So David Cloud, he has a book. Um, I've got it there somewhere. It's, um, I can't remember. Anyway, so here we have uh, the King James Version. So this is uh, quoting Hills. And so what he did, he actually quoted two separate quotes, but he put them in the same, because they mean the same thing, he put them in the same um, context, and it, it made a lot of sense to me. So the King James Version ought to be regarded not merely as a translation of the Texas Receptus, but also an independent variety of the Texas Receptus. But what do we do in those few places in which the several editions of the Texas Receptus disagree with one another? Which text do we follow? The answer to this question is easy. We are guided by the common faith. Hence, we favor that form of the Texas Receptus upon which more than any other God working providentially has placed the stamp of his approval, namely the King James Version, or more precisely, the Greek text underlying the King James Version. So I read through that and I went, that is gold. And just the more I've contemplated that, I'm like, yeah, well, why? I think there there is a presupposition against the translators of the King James Version against anything English. And I think this actually is part of the woke movement. I've sort of come to that conclusion. You know how it's like colonialism, white men bad, all this sort of stuff. I think this is part of that. Because among these academics, they're like, they'll respect Erasmus. They'll say, oh, he's a Roman Catholic, blah, blah, blah. But they'll still go, okay, we respect him as a great scholar. I mean, they'll even learn a Rasmarian um, pronunciation in Greek, which I don't think is that type of thing comes from Erasmus. I think that, that more comes from um, an American twang. Um, but then they have... Um, you know, so you've got Erasmus, you've got Stephanus, they respect him, then you've got Beza. But then it comes to the King James guys. And if any reading is chosen by them, you know, Mark Ward is like, it comes from the King James guys, you know, as if these guys are just the Laurel and Hardys of um, of academia in, in, in that, air, in, in that uh, time frame. And so uh, even the Elzevers will be respected. And so it's just a strange thing. And... Um, Actually, we've got quite a few quotes coming in, or quite a few comments. I'm just going to open it up to, <clears throat> to that. Okay, here we go. Because I don't want to get behind, because last time I had um, a few really good guests, like we had um, Jeff Riddle and um, Christian McCaffrey and, and a bunch of guys, and I, I sort of got half an hour behind their quotes um, in just answering everything, and, and it's sort of, by the time I got to where they were at, I, I, I wasn't even in tune with what they were talking about. So Stephen Hayes says, this is a great topic. <clears throat> even though there are very few deviations in the KJV from the Greek text of Beza, I agree that selections made by the KJV translators should be considered the final TR. And it's, I think it's very important to have that position because we're talking about the words of God. And this is where I find people have sort of lost a bit of ground getting in the weeds of this. And so, um, and I guess to like say uh, Robert Trulove, um, Jeff Riddle, um, 
there's a uh, you know group of guys who are sort of like okay well the tr but there, it, there's ways of saying this i've found ways of not being labeled kjvo um by saying okay all the readings are in the 1598 edition of Beza. And so obviously, um, if you follow me on my channel, I'm going through the 190 list uh, of Theodore Beza. I've done about 11 or 12 of those. And so, but, you know, I equate that there's only about 10% that are translatable. And so uh, DA Waite, he came up with a 20 number and Kirk DeVitro also did as well. And so uh, basically having 20 translatable differences from Theodore Beza's 1598 to the King James, or well, when you go through um, those places, you can see where Beza puts those readings in the margin or in his annotations. And so he'll talk about them. And so anything, any type of textual area or area of variation, he'll talk about them, even if there's a difference from Erasmus or, or Stephanus or anything. So he'll he'll mention them in his uh, um, annotations. Sorry, annotations. <laughs> it's uh, eight o'clock in the morning here, and my tongue's not um, it, my tongue's not working. It'll start kicking in about ten o'clock, and so um, I'm trying to say the fancy Latin name for the annotations or something, and so but we'll just call them annotations. But all the readings are there. And so if you go to the um, text, you can get, you can extrapolate every King James reading from the 1598. So it's the closest one. Uh, I mean, even um, you know, Scrivener, he based his on the 1598. And um, all the readings are there in, you know, there might be 20 readings that are uh, marginalized or, um, you know, in his annotations, but at the end of the day, they're still there. So that's that was my way of getting around. Oh, it's the King James, but at the, still, at the end of the day, I'm still going with the with the choices that the King James translators read. Even if you're going with Scrivener's text, you, this is still. You know, I know James White will say, "Oh, this is a back translation from the King James." Now. You know, obviously, everything James White says, there is you know, an element of truth and an element of error because, you know, he's trying to uh, downplay the TR and he's trying, you know, he's attacked the King James. He's probably probably one of the um, most vicious opponents of the King James Version um, of this generation. And Mark Ward is, is slowly becoming like that as well. Um, but at the end of the day... Um, all the words are found in the King James. And so people like James White, Mark Ward, um, academia, they're coming to this issue with a presupposition that the King James is a bad thing, that it's filled with errors, that the translation um, didn't use the, the correct methodology. So they didn't use um, you know, updated methods like the Granville Sharp rule and they were dummies, you know, they they might have known Latin, but they didn't really know Greek that well. And, you know, just these really stupid things. And, um, you know, James White's um, concept that, say, like Erasmus, you know, he was creating a Latin text, but he was learning Greek for many years and he was very well skilled in Greek. But then James White will say, oh, he wasn't even interested in the Greek. He was only interested in the Latin. Greek was like an afterthought to him. How does he know that? It's like me saying, okay, well, James White, he wrote a book on Mormonism and then he wrote a book later on about the King James Bible. So he, he wasn't really interested in the King James Bible issue. It was just an afterthought to him. You know, he's more interested in Mormonism. Everything he does is just, just to come against Mormons. It's like, how can, how can I say that? It's just not true. You know, I mean, um, but they say this type of thing about the King James translators, King James guys, you know, they oh, they knew Latin. They were very skilled in Latin. But when it came to the Greek, they didn't really know. You know, they just make these things up. And the more that I listen to James White, the more I realise that most of what he's been saying about um, textual issues over the years is just smoke and mirrors. There's, just, there's really no substance behind what he's saying. And usually he's very selective in what he argues about. 
because you notice that he on his channel he doesn't have like an open chat that you can just say hey james i found this error in your argument here he'll wait until he finds someone who who you know the the low hanging fruit who he can um you know, easily debate against their character and he'll wait until they say it and then say see look this guy's a psycho and he said it or wait until you know, uh, Stephen Anderson says it, or, you know, someone who's, you know, really crazy on stage and someone's yelling out, amen, 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 or something over and over. And it's like, see, these guys are psychos and they're trying to come against me and this is their argument. And, you know, I've just found James White to just be almost completely dishonest in the way that he operates. And um, I'm willing to discuss, like, you know, when I handed him the book on Revelation 16.5 and he refused to take it, basically uh, announced to the world that he wouldn't read it and then um, said that I was a psycho because I gave, I, I went out of my way to give him the book <laughs> and he was in Australia and he was only like, um, he was in a place called Brisbane, which is our main capital here. We were in a different state, but we just go over the border and we're in Brisbane. And I used to street preach in Brisbane with the same crew who invited him to their church. It was their church. I knew half of the people there. But he proclaimed that I was a psycho and desperate, desperately trying to get his attention and all this stuff. It's like, no, I was in the area and I was actually living in Pakistan at the time, came to Australia and I was like, oh, James White's going to Brisbane. I won't miss that opportunity. I'll go up and I'll give him the Revelation 16.5 book that I've been working on. Gave it, put it in his hand and he, he refused it and then announced he will never read it. I mean, what sort of apologist is that? It's just disgusting. I think... Um, while he does a, a few good things on, you know, um, Roman Catholicism and, and other things like seriously, he is just a jerk, an absolute jerk. And I, I kind of made it so that I would just look like an innocent lamb all the way through it to just see how far he'd go and to see what he's, what he would say. And even, um, non-Christian family members, was saying, who is this guy? What? How does he know these things about you, apparently? And I, I was like, I oh, know. I just want to see how far he would go to see how much of a liar he is and and to, to sort of sympathise with other people who have been through the mill with him because he knew nothing about me. And he he wouldn't he couldn't even remember my name. He just called me the TR guy. But after a while, it became he became obsessed with me. And then he did a whole program on my tweets um, I'd written some stuff on Twitter and then he blocked me so I could, couldn't answer them. And then he did a whole program in in a um, in like a Bible school setting. It was like, dude, you're not interested in, in open debate or anything. It just, he just wanted to slam me because he knew that my um, what I was saying was gaining traction. But you don't see him you know, lifting up the Revelation 16.5 card much anymore, do you? because I've fully nailed him and I still challenge him. I say, I'll, I'll debate you anytime. But um, <clears throat> so let's have a look at another quote. Stephen Hayes uh, says, I find the witch TR question by modern text critics a red herring as the handful of differences among the various TR editions is fundamentally analog analogous to um, the issues with the critical text and so what we see is um this continually gets brought up as as a gotcha moment you know the mark wards are like well <clears throat> sorry about my morning cough there um mark ward will just continually bring this up and he believes that his article the witch tr hasn't been answered so I know uh, Vince Krivda, he did, I think it was like 20 pages or more, maybe 30 pages of um, rebuttal against Mark Ward. And all Mark Ward said was, oh, he's an artist. So it's like you have to be full time. Uh, this is the whole, you know, Dillard's type of thing. Um, you have to be full time uh, to basically be accepted as a scholar by... Um, by Mark Ward. I mean, I've debated against uh, Vince Krivda. We did a debate on Easter. He's a smart guy. He knows his stuff. He does um, art work. So he, he'll go to a, a concert and just paint as he feels and, and then sell his paintings there and stuff like that. And that's just what he does. 
but that's cool. That doesn't mean you can't know about TR issues and and have a critique or have something to say. Um, I know a, a few people have um, you know say they've sufficiently answered the which TR um, points, but I think the whole this issue is completely answered by um, Edward Hills here. And I think it's great that Edward Hills um, has this quote <clears throat> because one of the things is because of the Westminster Confession of Faith, people tend to, you know, have to have, okay, it's in the Greek text, okay? And so, and I understand that, you know, and I believe that, say, like, you know, the 1598 of Beza, all the writings are there in his edition and in the annotations, the the little variants are there that make up the, the um, King James Version and they're all in Greek. So I can go that route as well. Um, I can go the route of, okay, well, um, you know, Scribner, he's looked back at all the other TR editions and, you know, sort of, like a smorgasbord and gone through it and ma married them up to King James English words and gone, well, that, that's where they got them from. And I can understand that too. And that's where a lot of pe people um, are, say like, you know, the Dean Bergon Society um, and the confessional bibliology guys. And so that's where you would say like this quote, um, the King James Version ought to be regarded not merely as a translation of the Textus Receptus, but also as an independent variety of the Textus Receptus. So this is David Cloud saying this. So David Cloud, he would be in line with the Dean Bergon Society. And so you're looking at D.A. Waite, Kirk DeVitro, um, a whole bunch of other guys. Um, and Theodore Letus, he was actually one of the founding um, guys of the Dean Bergon Society, but he pulled out. Well, he was rejected because he was actually charismatic at the time, but then he became a Lutheran. So he had... Um, he would have known about this type of thing as well. And so this type of thing has been known by guys from the Dean Bergman Society for quite a while, where they would say it's the Greek text underlying the King James. Now, when you go through um, Hill's book, which I've got right here, um, so he's got it, it's on page 220. So I'll just have a quick look. Um Page 220. <clears throat> yeah, hence the King James Version ought to be regarded not merely as a translation of the Textus Receptus, but also as an independent variety of the Textus Receptus. Now, the next quotation is on page 223. So it has, um, namely the King James Version, or more precisely, the Greek text underlying the King James Version. But then the next um, sentence is where most people would fall and it's not on this quote of cloud it says this text was published in 1881 by the cambridge university press under the editorship of dr scribner and there have been eight reprints since um, 1949 in 1976 also another edition of the text was published by in london by the trinitarian bible society um, and so he's answered to the underlying greek text is that it is the Scribner text, okay? So I'm sort of glad in a way that it, that Cloud sort of cut it short there. I guess he had to cut it short somewhere. I don't think that he deliberately cut it short. I, I guess it goes on to another issue of Scribner. Um, but I think he just wanted to show what Hills was saying here. And I agree wholeheartedly with what is said here, that... The thing is, like, I'm going through this text and saying, look, Scrivener, and, and this is one of the things which, um, say, Mark Ward is making a lot about this as well. He's saying, well, Scrivener was, you know, he wanted to delete, you know, 1 John 5, 7. He placed doubt on a lot of um, King James readings, TR readings. So uh, he's not a friend of the Texas Receptus. He's not a friend of the King James Version which is sort of a, I guess, you know, 70% true. I mean, if you go through um, the writings of Scribner, you can see, you know, his uh, book on the authorised version 
his first edition has something like, you know, 23 places where he wants to omit words or omit verses, you know, and, and change wording and things like that. By his last edition, he has so many that it's like, well, he's like a critical text guy. Uh, and where do you draw the line, you know, between someone just, if someone's a majority text guy, which I believe most of these guys were, you know, um, Bergon, um, Scrivener, Mills, uh, Hoskia, most of these guys sort of fell in the majority text sort of camp when they were pressed. Now, I know Bergon, and, you know, I've got great respect for a lot of these guys, you know, but at the end of the day, Bergon, he was like, well, we're defending every letter, every syllable, every word, right down to the le letters of the word of God, you know. But then he's like, oh, I'm not defending the TR. I'm defending what I call the traditional text. So it's almost like a, a bait and switch. You know, he, people were seeing him as a great defender of the Texas Receptus and a great defender of the, um, of the King James, which in places he was, but then he would turn around and say, I'm not defending the King James in every point. I'm not defending the, and so it's like, well, where are you standing then? He's creating an, a different, um, you know, and he's creating a different standard. And so um, we see that in, in many people, like we just saw, um, was it Erber, Erberhard? Overhard, no, that's not his name. Anyway, the um, the one uh, Dwayne Green interviewed recently, and I did a video on him and Jeff Riddle as well, but one of the things was he's come out and said, I'm a critical text guy, but then he'll override critical text methodology and um, the oldest manuscripts apparently, and he will override them for majority text reading. And so it came out that he was way more a majority text guy than anything. And I think this is the thing, like if you were like, he's a he's a critical text guy, he said he is, and then the next minute he's he's a majority text guy. And I think the thing is a majority text position for me is like um, a safe place where if you don't want criticism, you go that route because you, and you still look scholarly. I mean, you look at someone like James Snap Jr. He, you know, he has his, um, equitable eclecticism methodology and he he comes across you know as, as very learned and all the rest of it but i mean he's many times his arguments are the same as someone like stephen avery but stephen avery is just seen as you know by academia they're, they're just like we we just don't have anything to do with you or you know even like jeff riddle and other guys they're saying you know very similar things but having more conclusive definite uh, answers of where the word of God is instead of just James James Snap going okay well I think it is here and you know almost everyone in the world might disagree with him there because he's he's got his own authority his own standard um, at least you know all of us who are you know watching today probably there might be a few people who uh, are anti but we are in agreement where the TR is and what the words are and so this is the thing with people like Bergon and Scrivener and Miller, and these guys weren't in absolute agreement. And like, say, uh, Dean Bergon, you know, with uh, Matthew chapter 10, where it says, you know, raise the dead. He didn't think raise the dead was a genuine reading. Uh, he went through the first 14 chapters of Matthew, and I think he found 150 places where he wanted to change the TR. So you're looking at guys who want to create their own text and, to me, it's like these guys, yes, they had enough bullets to come against Westcott and Hort in their generation, but in no way are they like the Reformers and uh, in no way are they like, you know, Stephanus or Beza or, or, or the King James translator. They're, they're just not. And so um, I don't have to side with them. This is one of the things where I find, you know, the Dean Burgon Society, it's named after Dean Burgon, who ultimately, he has good, very good material, but then ultimately turns around and says that the TR is filled with mistakes. <laughs> it's like, well, 150. Um, what just in the first 14 chapters of Matthew, that's a lot. And so um, they might be, you know, tiny little things here and there, but once you go through the whole entire New Testament, you're looking at thousands of changes. So these are the type of issues that are, people want a nice smooth TR transition. And so 
they want you know the the many of the anecdotes are surrounding the tr about um scrivener to be true you know, scrivener was a, the defender of the tr and he remained on westcott and hort and ellicott's translation committee um or you know, revision committee he remained on their committee to um you know to be a stick in the mud and sort of you know say look you guys can can go so far but that's it sort of thing I mean, really, read his material. He's like, you know, one John five seven straight in the bin. Um, you know, he's placing doubt on the, the the things that he was fighting for were like the the last twelve verses of Mark or Brick of Bay Adultery. But, but read his books of what he wanted to delete. I think I I didn't realize. Like, I guess probably for the last 12, 13 years, I've known Scrivener's material differed from a, a TR KJV perspective. And I guess too, I was reading, because there has been this war between the TR people and the King James only people. And the King James only just have to point out and say, look guys, um, you know, Scrivener's, Scrivener wasn't a friend of the TR. And they just point out, Burgon said he wasn't a friend of the TR either and he didn't defend it. and. Yeah, and so they all they have to do is just point out some basic things. And so the TR people are sort of like, what do we do? And and it, it just seemed like a, a strange hole in the argument of say like the Dean Bergon Society. I've got great respect for someone like um, you know, DA Waite and what and the amount of research that he did into the King James is it's brilliant. But at, at the end of the day, I think he made a, a, a mistake by calling his group the Dean Burgon Society because I believe Dean Burgon started the majority text movement um, with his traditional text. And so, but this is something that, see, Mark Ward will probably you know, hear this through the grapevine and do a whole thing on the Dean Burgon Society. Um, you know, sh it shouldn't be called the Dean Burgon Society, it should, you know, because look at what Dean Burgon said and it will be another gotcha moment where we're actually talking about these things, thinking about these things. And um, the more in depth you get into this, it's just like, okay, well, you, you know this. If I was to talk to any, you know, people who are labeled King James only, Will King, even Jeff Riddle, they know all this stuff. It's not like a big mystery. But Mark Ward will make out like it's a big gotcha moment because they're, I think the Dean Bergen Society would have been better off being called the Texas Receptor Society or something like that. Then they wouldn't have had this silly issue because what you have now is um, Mark Ward turning around and saying, oh, look, Scrivener. Oh, Scrivener was actually against a lot of the Texas Receptors, um, you know, um, unique readings here and there. And look at, look at what he put here. And, what, and he's he's just coming against this, this concept that people think Scrivener was a TR guy. And... I guess in my mind, people who I was um, associating with online, and they knew this for a long time, and I w I've been saying this for a, a long time. And then Mark Ward comes along and you know says it, and it's like uh, it looks like a gotcha moment where it's not really, you know, it, it's just sort of people. I mean, a lot of people can't be bothered even going into a lot of this material because there's. There's just so much, um, so many weeds, and they're just like, look. I just, I just know this is my Bible, and that's it. And 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 seriously, that used to be um, how Christians could operate, but nowadays there's just so much dust thrown in the air. There's so so many weeds that you almost have to address this topic, and you have to get to a, a, a conclusion on this. So. I guess, you know, some people go so far in, in their scholarship and others follow them and they're like, you know, like the Dean Bergon Society and it's like, well, Dean Bergon's the good guy and it's it's like, well, not really. And um, anyway, I'm going to change here because I've got so many comments. I've only gone through two. Uh, the King's Table, I'm no fan of Ruckman either, either. They almost all have racist doctrine. It's disturbing. Yeah, I, that was one of the main things that I found out running the um, Peter Ruckman, um, anti-Peter Ruckman page was that they were just very anti-black. It was like, and even there were people on there who were Ruckmanites who were black and they were saying, uh, trying to defend what he was saying. And so I just kept putting, you know, these quotes of what Ruckman was saying. And then after a while, this guy just stopped 
being in that group. I, and it wasn't because, you know, he got offended with what we're saying. It was like he realised he didn't have an argument. It was he, he sort of backed in the corner and went, yeah, that's really bad. Because, <laughs> I mean, anyone who reads it, it's like, it's like early clan literature. It's like, um, it's just crazy. So we have Stephen Hayes says, the whole Ruckman issue is an ad hominem. Uh, we all abhor his race, racism. But don't use that as an excuse not to interact with his arguments on textual issues. He has some very important arguments. And that's one of the things too, is if you were to get the, the worst look or who are considered the worst... You know the you know James White would say Gal Rippling her with her acrostic algebra. You know Sam Gipp with his I don't know what he's done wrong, but I guess he's a Ruckmanite, and so uh, or Peter Ruckman. Um, you know um, even uh, Stephen Anderson, etc. The thing is, you still can get understanding from these people on on other things, and don't we all do that? Don't we all? You know, have I mean, who who do you know who's just orthodox on everything? <laughs> you know what I mean? On a, absolutely every little um, thing that you believe. I mean, there's very few, and I, I usually find that people who are like, yes, I follow, you know, just I just follow John MacArthur, or I follow this other guy, and it's, I'm usually just like, well, I'm sorry, I think too much for myself to, to just jump into someone else's theological realm I, I figure these things out and i read the bible and i go no sorry john MacArthur. i mean the the blood and death are, are, are a different thing i mean you know and things like that and so um but yeah the whole ruckman thing but if you look at all these guys who was the low-hanging fruit of king james only and tr only they would um i mean when you get someone like bart ehrman <laughs> he's still in the academy. When you get someone like Bruce Metzger, Carlo Martini, George Van Smith, Wes Scott and Hort, these guys were just, I mean, sure, you can get, half of these people are trained to go, when they get into the um, academy, that's like, okay, we have to do a thing on, on the Trinity and we have to do a thing on the blood of Christ and we have to prove that Jesus is God. And they sort of tick the boxes and go, see, I'm Orthodox okay, let's just continue and rip in the Bible to shreds. And, I mean, how many of these guys, like, would you ever think that you could go soul winning with Bruce Metzger? You know what I mean? It's like half of these guys, even, even when I listen to Bart Ehrman and he talks about how he was born again and he was an evangelical and he used to do this and do that. And, and I, I used to listen i listen carefully to what he would say in each one of his books i'd go through it and go well i'm just not sure uh if you know being on a campus among, you know, among all all these other people and i mean was he was he ever you know involved with you know some sort of street ministry or you know one-on-one -on -one witnessing and all this sort of stuff because it's like like I know someone like James White was, I think he's like faded it, you know, way back into the. Um, it's almost like if he witnesses to someone, he's got to you know, pronounce it on Facebook that he's done it. And I can understand that there are seasons in people's lives where you know they've been very evangelical and you know, going out preaching and and witnessing and handing out tracts and doing all that sort of stuff, and you can just get busy and you haven't done it for a while. But I, I just find that a lot of these people you wouldn't tend to naturally fellowship with. I mean, would you get um, Jennifer Nost and go out preaching with her and her family or or Tommy Wasserman or half of these people in the academy? I mean, to me, these... I mean, say Tommy Wasserman doesn't believe in hell, a literal hell. Um, Jennifer Nost is, you know, basically... Uh, she's supporting the, the, you know, transgender movement and says they're all Christians and things like that, and the Bible is really just a nothing book. But she's these people are the go-to gurus for the Prick of Adultery. And so, I mean, the the people they're criticising, Ruckman and these other guys, yeah, well, we mightn't agree with everything they're saying, but it's like these people are way more orthodox than, than the people in the academy. If you were to com you know, start comparing people. Um. 
James Sheffield says, uh, I know the critical issue, but prefer the AV. The critical issue, I guess that's the, uh, the critical text. Dwayne Green uh, says, hey -o. Um, how would you interact with those who say a translation can't be perfect? Um, <clears throat> very good question. That's a great question. Now, um, some friends of mine, um, they were translating for the EU. So they were translating Luxembourgish. And um, so I was at their house and um, got talking a lot about, you know, their, their translation methodology because, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in translation. And so I was saying, so how do you go through um, this material? Because they had to translate everything into Luxembourgish. So I'm pretty sure the EU, everything had to be in English. But because it was in Germany, it had to be in German as well. But then they had to put it into each um, language, each other language. So the main two languages were like, you know, uh, German and English, and then it was translated into other languages. So it was quite in depth the, the way they did it. And you're talking about, you know, financial treaties, border treaties, um, you know, things to do with war, things to do with weapons, things to do with, you know, climate change, all sorts of, you know, stuff. And so these guys translating everything to Luxembourg, what they said was, um, that they would um, firstly get the documents uh, in the first languages, so that would be the, in the English and probably the German, and then they would just throw it straight into Google Translate. Now, I know Google Translate can be pretty bad. <laughs> I've, I've been down that rabbit hole where I'm like, what is that saying? And then after a while, you realize it's just Google is throwing in a few Bible verses there, you know, or, or something from somewhere else. And it's like, man, I've... You know, it's not giving me the correct answer. And usually with just um, a, a lexical definition, it, it will give you um, a good answer. Um, but if you want something in its context and everything like that, it, many times it, it is poor. Um, but sometimes it's very good as well. And so, uh, but if you, it depends on the language. If you were, were to go with Latin, <clears throat> Latin is really hard. <laughs> and um, but sometimes with Greek, it's good. If um, And sometimes I'll use Bing as well. But so anyway, these guys, they use Google Translate just to give them a rough draft template. And then I said, so what do you go through from there? And they said, well, we use, you know, dictionaries and things like that. And I said, so is anything lost, you know, because you're translating you know, some pretty important things, you know, talking about nuclear weapons, talking about, you know, presidents, prime ministers, kings, empires, you know, terrorism, all sorts of things. This is very important. And I said, is anything lost? You know, and at that stage, I, I guess it was probably, uh, you know, about 12 years ago. Um, at that stage, they just said, no, nothing's lost. And I said, so you can translate everything over from, you know, the English or German into luxembourgish and you don't lose anything and they said no we don't lose anything i said why is that and they said well we know the languages we know luxembourgish fluently and we know that the, the english are, and, and german fluently as well and so we can easily translate those over and so it, it just got me thinking because it was just one of these things that just kept getting thrown up like oh you can never translate anything accurately you know from one language to another but usually that's coming from people who are monolingual and so um, people who only know one language and this is the downfall of most people in um, the uk in um it's not in canada they actually have many languages but in the usa and in australia where i live most of the if you talk to most people they'll speak english and when you go traveling, everyone else wants to learn English so they don't speak their local language with you. They speak English because they're trying to learn. Um, my, my wife, for example, she speaks four languages. And she speaks English amazingly. She speaks um, um, Urdu. She speaks Punjabi. And Urdu is basically akin to Hindi. So all the Bollywood films and all that are all in Hindi, which is basically Urdu. They both used to be called Hindustani up until 1880 when there was a split. 
and it sort of went the Urdu went sort of uh, with Arabic um, you know type of you know sort of went the Muslim route and the H Hindi um, went the um, Hindu sort of route with with the um, with their Indian script and so uh, we living in uh, countries where we just all speak English many times we don't realize how you can translate things over and even uh, idioms I mean the Bible's not filled with idioms there are idioms there but it's not just like every second word is an idiom or every second you know sentence contains idioms there they are there and to understand Hebrew idioms and understand Greek idioms is very very important but also to understand English idioms. So this is one of the things people will say, oh, there's an idiom there in the Greek. Um, and that's been, um, you yeah, know, they'll go th go for a uh, an interlinear reading, a very literal reading of, um, of an idiom from Greek or from Hebrew. But many times these idioms can be translated as another idiom. And so... Um, we were looking at that recently in a debate that I had with uh, CJ Cox um, with the God forbid, you know, God forbid, um, even Dan Wallace, he's said that it's, it's an, um, an idiom. It's, a, a, it's an English idiom, which is basically, you know, may it never, ever happen, but it's actually a prayer. And um, there were several places in scripture where, uh, it said, may, um, may the Lord never let this happen. It just became this sort of Hebrew um, proverb that was said. And then eventually that sort of made its way into the Greek. But also in Greek, they had their own version of that where uh, they were talking about their gods and let the gods never let this happen. So, so it was like the worst case scenario, you know, never let that happen, you know, God forbid. And, and so... Um, understanding idioms, a lot of the time people are, are throwing up idioms in the King James Bible saying that they're mistranslated. Um, like, you know, Moses was beautiful to God. Uh, in Acts, the word God isn't there, but understanding the, the Hebrew idiom that was brought across there because it was Stephen talking to a bunch of Jewish guys, so it was obviously a Hebrew idiom. Um, I had uh, Stephen Boyce brought that up as one of the reasons why he left the TR movement because of that. And it's like, well, th there are answers for these things. It's just understanding linguistics. And that, I think that's a very important part of um, defending the Bible is understanding linguistics. And um, you don't have to be an expert on it, but just just being able to keep up with the arguments because there are many good arguments there for a lot of the readings in the King James Version. Um, but just being able to understand them, to wrap your head around it, um, you know, we should all be at that level where we can understand that and go, okay, well, I can see why the King James translators did that. So <clears throat> so that's how I would interact, uh, Dwayne. It's a really good question. Um, of all the TR positions, this one in my estimation, is the most consistent. And that's what I feel too, because um, like, you know, I've got a lot of respect for pretty much everyone in the, in the movement, I guess you'd call it, at the moment. And, um, but I would turn around and say, like, say with uh, Robert Trulove and Jeff Riddle and that I don't necessarily agree um, with, with it just being... You, know, you, you sort of have to keep it in the Greek manuscripts where I'm like, well, we're going with an English Bible here and we're matching the Greek up. It's like, can we actually turn around and say it's English? You know, And this is one of the things where the English has made a standard. When Jerome did his Latin, it was a standard and that was based upon the Greek. So the thing is, um, I guess, yeah, there is a view where you're sort of, sort of stepping out of the Westminster Confession if you're saying it's it's in the English. But the thing is, critical text guys do this with the LXX, where they'll have they'll say, "Oh, the LXX says this," and so we're going with that reading. And it's like, "Well, hang on, if I said all oh, King James says this, so we're going with we're going to override the Greek." People would say, "Okay, kooky, Ruckmanite, um, get the banjo out and let's let's have a sing along." 
But when they do that with the LXX, it's it's good scholarship. You can override the LXX now. You know the Ugaritic is like you know the go-to thing. Override the Hebrew, and there's lots of these different types of texts. If you just read the New King James, um, you know, translators to the readers, the, or the preface, you can see they're going to Targums, the Samaritan Pentateuch. They're going to all different types of things, overriding the the Hebrew because. In the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew is, is more stable than the Greek in a sense where um, in a general sphere, we, we TR people believe the, the Greek is 100% stable and these things are just aberrations like, like the Jehovah's Witnesses Bibles have just appeared and it doesn't mean we have to join in and say, oh, there's lots of these weird Bibles out there. We're like, no, we've had our Bible, we've got our Bible, it's stable. And, and so um, these other things are, are seen as aberrations. And so when we look at the... Um, the Hebrew text, the Hebrew text on a whole has been a, a lot more stable um, than the whole, you know, critical text, everything that's happened with the with the Greek and, you know, variations and things like that. But the way that they seem to be overriding a lot of the readings is by going to um, these other, you know, Ugaritic and dip, redefining things, squeezing in readings from, um, you know, targums and um you know a midrash commentary and and i mean i've read the i've read the new king james you know many 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 times probably over hundreds it probably not just a hundred into the hundreds of times when i first got saved uh in the first week of my christianity i've me memorized proverbs um chapter one from one to seven um and I was going through memorizing the New King James and going through it was it was my Bible and I read it and read it. Um, sometimes I'd read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in just one session, just go through for you know three or four hours and just read the whole thing through. I just wanted because I, I I guess there was a little bit of word of faith stuff in a book that I was reading, and they were saying the more you read the Bible, the more it will transform your mind and all this. So I was just like, okay, if the more that I read the Bible, the more I will become set free, you know, sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, regardless of, of the you know, motive or whatever, I was plowing through the Bible. And what I would do also is, um, or later on when I converted um, to the King James position, after I started realizing, hang on, there's lots of differences between the, because I would go through Proverbs of the New King James, then I'd go through the Old King James, you know, that's way different. Sometimes it's saying the opposite thing. You know, I, I was really discouraged about that. And so I started studying into it and that's why I came to my position. But what I started doing when I went to an old, old King James position is I would get and the audio Bibles. I had a bunch of CDs. I'd play them and for an hour a day, I would stare at the screen and read along with it. So that way I could pronounce every word properly um, or, you know, the way that the the standard was on, on those cds anyway <clears throat> so anyway i'm sort of rabbit trailing down that path so we've got quite a lot of comments here so um yeah that was matthew everhart that's it so matthew everhart and so um i'm already way behind i'm like half an hour behind already so let's just go through this I'm not a Byzantine guy because it's safe. I'm a Byzantine guy because I don't believe the originals would reflect a localized Alexandrian text. Yeah. Um, and I understand that in a sense where, like, I'm pretty sure Robert Trulove, he, um, he was looking at these issues and came to a majority text position. I think it was like Family 13 or something like that. Um, I'm pretty sure Jeff Riddle, um, he was a critical text guy and went to a majority text sort of position and then came over to the received text. And I'm not saying in every case, but I guess the thing is some some of the things that are a downfall for the majority text thing, I mean, Byzantine text, majority text are, are pretty much, you know, very similar. Um, you've got, you know, I think Von Sodden, was it Von Sodden or Caspar René Gregory? I think it was Von Sodden. He um, collated 400 manuscripts, and that's usually where the majority text comes from. But basically, it's a Byzantine text type of thing. 
and I can understand that you know if you're only looking at the Greek but the thing is the the Bible was also uh, preserved in Latin manuscripts the Bible was also preserved in um, in the early church writings and there are also things like solecisms that in the latter um, editions of the Greek like say the 1904 Greek um, so the Comma Johannium is put back into the text because they understand there's a solecism there that they can't reconcile unless it's got the comma put back in it. So I guess the thing is, to me, a Byzantine text, I mean, it's it's good. It's way better than the critical text, but it's like it's it's almost like looking at a document that hasn't gone through spell check yet or hasn't they haven't compared it with all the other issues it's just sort of like um okay well that's the bible that they had in that empire at that time but there are differences uh very minor differences between um some uh majority text readings by byzantine text readings and so that would be a good thing to look into um i mean i've got um you know pickering's material there and also this is a very good book as well. Um, what's that one? I'll just get that on the big screen. Oh, there we go. Byzantine text type, a New Testament text of criticism. So that's by uh, Sturz. So Sturz actually taught um, uh, Dan Wallace. So he's... And he basically talks about how the Byzantine readings are in the papyri and things like that. Which so uh, that's that's a good book. I mean, to, for me, this is sort of like um, how would I explain it? I guess it's like it, you know you probably understand like um, I mean I think Dwayne, you're Canadian, you're not American, but so for me this would be my understanding of say like um, American politics. If you are, yeah, obviously, you'd probably be a, a Republican, okay? But then there's different types of Republicans. So you've got the Tea Party guys. You've got all sorts of different types of Republicans who would be against the mainstream Republicans, believing that they're, you know, pro-war. and um, But then you'd have the Ron Paul type of libertarian Republicans. And so they're like the, the true diehard, you know, um, yeah, in the Federal Reserve, you know, have gold as money and all that sort of stuff. So they would be against even some of the Tea Party guys and some of it would mix over and all the rest of it. So to me, like, say, the critical text would be like, you know, the general sort of, you know, thing. But then you, as you get closer, it's like, oh, the Tea Party movement. But the thing is, if you really wanted to get the real thing, it, you would you know become like a ron paul libertarian sort of thing that that's how i you know followed a little bit of american politics over the years and that's how um that's where you would sort of end up and so to me it's sort of like the, the byzantine text and the majority text is sort of like a middle movement which is better than the mainstream but it's like uh it still doesn't go all the way and it's actually um pr probably only really made um famous and made um, what it is because of the Texas receptors. There's no real um, Bible that's based upon the majority text, you know, in a sense, we've got the web Bible and there's a few others, but a Bible that's being used, utilized, that's been stable for many, many years. And I think you mentioned even in one of your shows, it's, it's only been around since, I think you mentioned 1979. So yeah, I usually say 1980s sort of era. It's like, let's create this new text called the majority text. And, you know, the Hodges and Fasted, the guys who were behind the New King James Version, they um, worked on that and um, they've created their text and they weren't TR people. Um, and many of the people who worked on the New King James were not, T well, none of them were TR people. And so I guess in a way it's sort of like, um, you know, it's just creating a third. It's like, say, the Tyndale House text. It's just another text out there that's sort of like, well, why? You know what I mean? Like, what? why? And when, when I look at, say, um, Byzantine readings, say, at, like, Luke 2.22, I mean, to me, the internal biblical evidence that it's only the woman who needs to be purified, that completely... 
uh, overrides the amount of manuscripts. And that's the thing. A lot of people are trained to think that the King James position or TR position is a majority text position. It just so happens to, you know, most of the time be backed up by the majority. But at times it's like, no, that goes against the word of God or that makes Jesus a liar or that makes this happen. And this doctrine is eradicated because of that. And and the thing is, too, it's um, sometimes being Byzantine. I mean, the empire was... Um, Latin speaking, it was Byzantine speaking. And so there are good things in the Latin. And so that's one of the things, that's why it was so important that um, the Latin became standardised. The Greek also at the same time became standardised and that's why the reformers always had the, the diglots, the Latin and the Greek, because these were the two main things. Oftentimes you only hear uh, the arguments for the Byzantine or the, or, the, or the Greek or, you know, and it's like, well, what about the Latin? You know, there's there's thousands of manuscripts that have this reading or that reading and they're in the Latin. And so, and it wasn't like there was this great wall of China between the two. They did, they did uh, mix, you know, they, they um, sure up until the age of printing, there was a, a bit of a, you know, because of what happened with the, with the Ottomans basically and the fall of Constantinople. But um, before that, there was a mixing. There was there were some readings that um, had sort of fallen out. I say one John five seven, that were very strong in the Latin that that did leak back into the Byzantine text and things like that. But um, yeah. So anyway, that's my little take on that. Let's just go through some more of these comments. Dean Bergon. So this is Helge Evanson. Um, I know I say Helge. I know I'm saying that wrong, but um, forgive me. Dean Bergon did not want to revise the AV, um, did not want to replace it as the official Bible of the Church of England. He said it should stand as it is. He was KJVO. Okay, so, um, but I guess it comes down to his true motivations and what he wrote himself. And so, um, yeah, and in the next question uh, or the next um statement it says Dean Bergen wanted to revise the Greek TR but not the KJV and I guess because he was an Anglican minister uh, he was like okay well that's good enough but in his um, in his writings basically saying the underlying um, text of the KJV is corrupted the TR is corrupted underneath that and so um, that's where my alarm bells go off a bit because um you know saying saying that you want the the king james version to be the standard um simply because it's like a stabilizer of religion or society or you know people in politics have used it or what like say if people turned around and said okay well the luther bible has been used for this many years it's stabilized our country it's stabilized our language and all that and you might have a million really good arguments for it but if there are departures from truth that's where it's like no we should update that and for me i can't i can't stand seeing things that are so close to the truth but are not you know whether even when there's fiber that's why i mean i know people yeah i, I go through you know scrivener's text and i'm like well no that's that's that shouldn't have been changed or no, Beza didn't really have that reading. You've changed it for no reason, and I'm pointing out those type of things in that, which I guess that's sort of coming against the standard, you know, Trinitarian Bible Society understanding of the TR, um, which you know, say even that sort of puts me at loggerheads with people like Stephen Anderson. He said, you know, people who say that there's mistakes in this are just nitpicking and all that, and it's like, well. I'm just interested in interested in truth and every word. And so I'm actually looking and hunting for those little changes and the tiny little bits and pieces so that we can, you know, work those things through. And um and so yeah, I mean it, it's it's a lot easier just to sort of hold, you know, I could have just gone hold that up and say, Yeah, that's it. And a lot of the time I will concede and say, Well, that's the closest thing that we got. But um, ultimately, when it comes down to this thing here, what, what Hill said, it's like we favour that form of Texas receptors upon which more than any other God working providentially has placed a stamp of his approval, namely the King James Version. And so that's the thing if, um, 
I mean, you know, Bergon wanted to change the Greek. If he had done a complete Greek edition of his day, it would have differed from the King James. Then that probably would have got it called the TR, you know, two or whatever or whatever. And then we would have had this whole thing of the King James version not matching up with Vergon's TR. And so that, that's to me, that's problematic. And um, as much good as Dean Bergon did, uh, I mean, I would say that he actually caused a little bit of damage um, by having that type of the traditional text position. And I know it's, it's hard because it's, he's such a great scholar and we want him on our team. But at the end of the day, um, you know, even Moses, he he got mad and hit the rock and wasn't allowed into the promised land. And I, I see some of these guys as they come really close, but there's 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 no ribbon at the end. It's like, well, sorry, Dean John William Bergon, you did really good, but um, the traditional text just doesn't match up with the the, the standard of the Texas Receptus and the King James version. Um, Okay, and so, but really good. That's a really good discussion um, with what you said about how he didn't want to change the Bible, and he was KJV. And so, um, one of the interesting things is here in Australia, we because you know we we were um, founded by um, Great Britain, we're still actually under Great Britain. We're a Commonwealth, a bit like Canada. We have a Queen. Um, we. Uh, a representative government underneath a monarchy. And so we are only a representative. We do have a lot of autonomous power. But in 1975, when the CIA didn't like our prime minister, um, the Queen got involved in, and basically uh, sacked our prime minister <laughs> through, uh, through a loophole, which they've changed now and they couldn't do. But now it doesn't really matter. The CIA, just they just dictate who's coming in and out anyway through Rupert Murdoch. But and so we're basically we we don't have really any autonomous power. Um, we, we just do what America tells us to do in Australia. We're, we're not a free country, <laughs> basically. If America had said we're going to go to war with China tomorrow, we would just go okay. Yep. Yeah. We wouldn't even ask why. We just go, okay that because we just understand that we're like the fifty first state of America. We're just overseas and we're sort of like California. We're a bit lefty, and we just do whatever we're told. And so that's just how Australia runs. And that we've tried to change it, tried to change the political system, but it's, you know, there's too many sheep here <laughs> that just don't think. And so uh, it's, it's really hard to, um, and what would you change it to? I mean, we've, we've been very prosperous and it's like, well, okay, we're, we're just tied to this war machine. We just have to do that. So anyway, it's a bit of a sidetrack. But we used to be King James only here in Australia. And so you would have, um back in the day there's there's acts of parliament that say only the king james version will be used in churches and so just like they had the really strict rules concerning prayer books and things like that you know only the the book of common prayer would be used and you know this ed other edition won't be used and, and things like that they made it so the king james version was used and before parliament um, before every uh, session of parliament they say the lord's prayer from the king james version the King James Version is sitting there in Parliament. And so there, there is a lot of biblical reference uh, in our government. So we were basically, our whole country was King James only. We didn't accept the Douay Reims. We didn't accept any Catholic edition. But, um, you know, I guess as time progresses, there'll probably be an NIV standing there soon, you know, with rainbow colours all around it. Um, okay, so Image Bearer says, Hey, Dwayne. So when is Nick going to make an appearance on your channel? I think I actually learned about this channel because of yours. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'll accept any invite anywhere. I guess um, I know that Dwayne said he wanted to have a uh, King James onlyist uh, on his um, on his platform there, where I wouldn't really fall into the category of a true, you know, Sam Gibb. Gail Ripplinger, Peter Ruckman, King James only. So I've been against these guys, you know, for years and years. And so, um, or not against them, but against, um, you know, some of the extreme things that they've said. Not everything they said is wrong. I mean, 
I would encourage people to just search for, you know, Gail Rippling and his books. That half of them are available for free on PDF. You just find them on the internet, just floating around. But um, many times what happens is people make lists and it's just like, okay, well, this verse is in, this verse is out. This verse is in the NIV, but it's not in the New American Standard Version, but it's in the King James and this sort of thing. And so there's lists everywhere. And so, but the thing is then someone will have a list of stuff or say a whole bunch of stuff about Thayer or Strong's or, um, you know, some sort of dictionary, but then they'll give their own personal opinion and it's like, well, it's related to the bafferment. Um, it's related to masonry. Uh, it's a new age concept. The new world order is here. And it's like, okay, well, I can skip over that little bit that they've said, but a lot of the other stuff is just true because it's, the, you know, the conclusions that they come to mightn't be great, but, most of the time, what Gail Ripplinger has said in her books, beside the built-in um, dictionary, I don't, I don't groove on that. I think it's ridiculous. I've tried that; it doesn't work. And, um, but yeah, some of what they're saying is very, very true and very good. And and it's th that's the problem is someone like James White will only focus on the acrostic algebra thing, or only focus on these strange little bits in like a book that's you know. <laughs> hugely thick you know obviously they're going to have their own personal opinion every now and then and if their personal opinion is a bit weird or a bit tex mars ish or you know um you know, sort of mix a bit of david ike in there and a bit of um alex jones or whatever i mean the whole new world order you know bible i mean i don't know but i just with the um the wrestlers the the, the the nwo guys it just sort of to me the new world order is just like a kid's thing it's, it's just lost its sting you know having uh, kissinger there you know it's a new world order and all that i mean i understand there is a real new world order and things like that and people are pushing that in the novus auto seclorum and there, there are occultic things but it's like it's been milked to the point where it's like it's not even a scary thing at all it's just you know nwo it's like you just picture these wrestlers in in their undies running around and um trying to make money but um but yeah so i don't know if i fall into the king james only category um that Dwayne would want um wesley robinson said have you interacted with uh, van cleek's uh sacred standard of you so very good question there um i i guess what i'm looking at is Taylor DeSoto's material, I would recommend it to anyone. Taylor DeSoto has done some very good um, material against Mark Ward, against Peter Gurry, against Elijah Hickson, and for the, you know, the TR, for the KJV. And he tends to talk, um, yeah, he talks a lot of facts and things like that, but a lot of it is warring philosophies, and which I haven't really gotten that much into i guess because my christianity didn't have a lot of um i guess i was presuppositional but didn't know it um in a way you know it's but um, what i'm doing at the same time is looking at anti-presuppositional arguments as well by people like uh, david polman and so david, david polman has come against um you know the van Tillian, um Oh, actually, you're saying Van Cleek. Okay. So I'm, I, I just read Van Til. Sorry. But anyway, I'll finish what I'm saying and then I'll, I'll get to that. So, um, yeah. So uh, Van Til, um, you know, presuppositionalist um, concepts. I really need to understand that more. Um, I guess people who are reformed, like uh, Taylor DeSoto, Jeff Riddle, and others, this is just like their morning breakfast cereal, you know, that. Um, presuppositional uh, apologetics and things like that where I, I guess i've more been into like dave hunt um uh who else uh, christian witness ministries um and so these guys have they're just like oh, it's just bible it's not not like okay westminster confession of faith says this all the reformers said that we, we understand that the reformers can be wrong and so sometimes i would be at, just like the early church writers can be wrong um I might turn around and say, well, Theodore Bees is wrong or Calvin's wrong on this or whatever. And so, um, but yeah, so anyway, I read what you're saying wrong. So you're looking at Van Cleek. So Van Cleek's um, sacred standard view. So I haven't heard of that. So I'm pretty sure Van Cleek was on uh, 
Dwayne Green's um, show recently. Was he the one who did the Jots and Tittle book? I'm pretty sure he is. Um, maybe I can just Google him. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm pretty sure this is what Van Cleek... So I haven't read Van Cleek's material. Um, okay, so it's on Kindle Unlimited. It's free, it looks like. Wow, that's pretty cool. Zero. Oh, no, you have to be part of Kindle Unlimited. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So you pay five dollars, okay, but that's fine. But yeah, I really should look at that and get into that. And um, I really enjoyed what Peter Van Cleek said. There were there were a few things there that it would be great to have a, an entire show here on um, on Psalm twelve and also the Jots and Tittles verse, um, and maybe all those verses that are used for preservation and how they've been used historically and also how they're used in other languages um that would be very important but yeah i haven't really um looked that much into this and so uh and obviously here we're looking at westminster confession of faith section eight and so um this like i said is just sort of bread and butter for guys like jeff riddle and uh christian mccaffrey and uh, but for myself um lately i've been listening to lots of bart Ehrman material de he debates he's done i guess I just want to get up to that standard where um, if anyone asks me any of his, um, you know, questions or anyone points to his argumentation, I'm able to have an answer for that. But, um, okay, so Dwayne Green says, Image bearer, huh? I don't necessarily agree with Nick, but I think his position is one of the more consistent TR positions. And that's why I've taken this position because... I mean, I couldn't, um, with all honesty, you know, someone uh, who was a King James only and saying, oh, the King James overrides the Greek and all this. I, I just thought that was sort of weird. But then in the end, I'm like, well, isn't that's exactly even what Westcott and Hort thought. The, the, the committee under Ellicott, they were commissioned, they commissioned Scrivener to create this by, you know, getting... Beza's text, which is most of it, and but then in those finer points, they're to go to the King James. So they even understood where the true TR was. It was underlying the King James version, but it just never got printed. So usually, what I say um, when people are asking me, you know, where I stand with this, I usually just say, "Look, the King James translators they used Theodore Beza's fifteen ninety eight text." Um, his ceiling became their platform and they they basically you know took their hat off to Theodore Beza and said we appreciate all the work that you've done we're not even going to change hardly anything except for 20 tiny little places because you've done so well and so it's not like they just went out and, and changed a whole bunch of stuff they just they changed 20 places and the good thing was Theodore Beza's 1598 he has his Greek then next to it, he has his own Latin translation, including italics, including, you know, um, punctuation, you know, uh, grammatical uh, issues in Latin and things like that, which could be translated over into English. So these guys could see how he would had translated things as well. But they did amend it in about 20 translatable places. Um, but they never printed their edition of the Greek. So, but they would have had to have had a Greek text made. So, because how else would um, the way that they actually did their translation? How else would the, how else would the other translators know that they've amended the text of Beza, um, or else they would just would have all said that's an error there, you know? So, um, what uh, what happened and the way that the King James has translated? just say there's 60 translators that that's been a number that's been floating around for a few years so it makes the math quite easy because there were six committees so say 10 in each committee so um say the committee that was to do um the four gospels and revelation they were to all all 10 of them 
do a translation by themselves. So they would have looked at uh, Geneva. They would have looked at whatever they wanted to look at, but they would have... I mean, you imagine if you're on a, a translation committee with people like... Um, you know, Lancelot Andrews or Henry Seville or, you know, these guys are like absolute giants um, with their um, scholarship. You would have been petrified to be around these guys. These guys would have been chatting together in Latin. Uh, they, you know, someone like Miles Smith, he's just just so happens to be creating a uh, an Arabic dictionary and, you know, um, Henry Seville taught the Queen of England Greek for years and, you know, these, uh, Lancelot Andrews knows 21 languages. So you don't want to say, hey, yeah, I know Greek. And then he's like, okay, but I might have to look and just start speaking fluent Greek. And you're like, oh, actually, I, I know how to read the alphabet, you know, like most critical text people. Um, and so you have, you know, these 10 people, they're all to do their edition, translate it in 10 different ways, I guess. And then they were all to amalgamate those 10 into one edition so that's 11 times it's been translated so far then they're to send that off to the other five groups to have a look at it and to uh you know make notes and all the rest of it so they send it off to the other five groups those five groups go through it and you know they might have their own little thing that they've studied out and worked out oh no that word doesn't fit in there or or we're trying to make um you know a a, a before the cross uh, understanding of that word and an after the cross understanding of that word. And so we, we, we're going through that type of pattern. And so you have five more times that it's done. So you've got you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I've actually, I remember saying there was it was done 14 times, but it's probably way more. <clears throat> and so then you have... Um, uh, well, that committee then has to look at all that argumentation and, you know, if there's any good argumentation then they have to put that into their text, then there's um, revision committees and then there's a final committee who go over it at the end. And so, I mean, all during that time, how would have those other five groups known that they had followed this other Greek text? And so that's where I think someone like John Boyce was probably instrumental in letting them know, hey, we're going with the text of Beza except for this. And he probably had, you know, 20 things written down on a page. And the thing was, some of these translators were with Theodore Beza. They, they had um, gone over to France. They'd been friends with him. They'd done debates with him against Roman Catholics. And, you know, it wasn't like Theodore Beza was so far detached from them. He was in their generation and so, some of the people knew him very well. And so... Um, they like even um, Tremelius, who was um, Tremelius, Janius, and Theodore Beza did a Latin translation, and that was in about um, 1580, I think it was, and that became the standard Latin translation for about 300 years. But Tremelius, he was in England for a while, and he stayed with um, the main translator for the Bishop's Bible, so he would have had influence in the Bishop's Bible as well. He stayed there for about eight months, I think, in his house. And so it's quite interesting when you start looking at different biographies, you see names come up and you see this uh, cross-pollinating of different people. And especially Theodore Beza, his name comes up a lot when you're doing um, a search into the King James translators. So any one of those King James translators could have done their own Greek edition and it would have been accepted as a definitive, like, just like Theodore Beza's one. It's like, okay, that's good enough. I mean, who are the Elzevers? We don't even hardly know much about them, but... Their one is like, yep, that's a TR edition. We'll cross that off. You know, I'm, I'm sure if Lancelot Andrews did an edition, we would go, yes, that, that was a good one. But they never printed that. They just printed their final edition in English. Having, uh, like Theodore Beza had himself and his own team, and he was writing off the back of you know, other other people, you know, um, Calvin and, um, you know, the Syriac editions and things like that. And, and outside of the closed class of witnesses, um, you know, the close class of witnesses is basically the Latin and the Greek and the early church writings. But outside of that, you have the, you know, the tr translations like the Syriac and things like that, the Arabic. And so Janius, he was involved with the Arabic. But, um, yeah, so any one of those guys could have done their own TR and it would have been accepted, but they didn't. They didn't do that. And the Elzevers doesn't match up with the King James. And so you just have the 
the King James. And so, and 250 years later, Scrivener comes along and they're like, well, we want to change the English Bible. And so like, we, to really change the English Bible, you're going to have to show where, where we're changing the Greek. And so it's like, okay, well, let's produce this. So he says there's 190 changes. I think most of them are untranslatable. And if you've watched any of my videos on that, you can you can see that. Um, so I'm just going to... Oh, yeah, there's only three more um, comments here, and then I'm going to throw up the link again. Image Bearer says... Um, yeah, I understand. I am still attempting to wrap my head around all of this. I appreciate Nick's videos, debates, and his patience in talking with others. Um, he would make a great interview, I think. Well, thanks, Image Bearer. I'm not sure who you are, but I really appreciate you um, and your lovely and kind and char charitable words. <laughs> I can be, um, I guess, a bit of a stick in the mud w with... Uh, some people like say mark ward he would probably just say that i'm too toxic or whatever and it's like but i don't really care you know I've, I've sort of gone through lots of church controversies and i've been called every name under the sun um, by people and and threatened and all sorts of things and it's like in the end i just don't really care what people say about me i just say what i think is truth and i usually don't go the route where i think everyone's a christian I know many times it'll be before a debate and it's like, okay, it's good to see us brothers in the Lord. We're all, and I'm thinking, I don't know if this other guy's a Christian. I have no idea. You know, it's like I'm not just going to pronounce someone saved. To me, pronouncing someone saved is just as much of a judgment as pronouncing someone as unsaved. If I said, okay, we're here when none of us are Christians, it's like, well, how do you know that? You know, um, And so that's... You know, some, something that, that I guess, you know, someone like Mark Ward, you know, if I'm harsh on people and I say, look, I doubt, you know, Metzger was a, a Christian or, or Bartom was even saved at all, you know, uh, and someone like James White, you know, the amount of lies that he tells, I, I can't find that he's a Christian. You know, people get pretty offended, offended at that, where in Australia that seems like a normal thing to sort of say. I guess in America there is a lot of um, padding. Um, oh, that's what I find. There's a lot of padding and people don't want to upset people's feelings. I'm way over on the other side of the lake, so I can upset your feelings and you still can't get me. But, um, yeah, anyway, so I just sort of – I thought I'd let you know just so you, you know what you're dealing with that I'll probably I, – I do say things that can be offensive at times. Um, your view of the KJV is – is unique to a number of KJV only as I've known or have listened to. And so, yeah, that's, um, I guess I didn't, I thought that King James onlyism was just sort of like a weird Ruckman sort of thing. And I guess I still don't believe in what they believe. I wouldn't, I, I didn't classify myself as King James only. My whole ministry is Texas Receptus. That's the whole thing. But then I've just come around to the same conclusion that even Westcott and Horde had, that where is the, the final TR? When they commissioned Scrivener to do this, they said, go to the King James. So that's all I've done. And then I'm, then by default, it's like, oh, you're a King James only. So I think it's like, but I guess anyone grabbing this text, you could label them King James only. And that's, so this is where James White has a field day because he's like, Oh, it's just King James onlyism, uh, and so he's created you know the five definitions of King James onlyism, and um, most most of those definitions are, are, are ridiculous. Like he even has, um, uh, who was it? Hodges from Hodges and Fasted. He has Hodges in one of the the a name mentioned in his book there. So I'm, I've got his book right here. So I might just quickly have a look at that. Um, the five different types of King James Onlyism. So, you know, the first one is like your grandma. Yeah, here we have the King James Only. I like the KJV the best. But you've got to understand that, that that's group one. That's King James Only. If you like KJV the best, you're still King James Only. So it's like the the... Categories are so loose. Um, yeah, then group two, the textual argument. TR only people 
that's them. And so he says here, um, there are a number of possible positions that fall within this one category. One group that would strongly reject the term King James Version only, but believe that the Greek text used by the King James Version translators are superior to those used by modern translations would be majority text advocates. This viewpoint asserts that the best reading um, should be the one supported by the consensus or the majority of the existing Greek manuscripts. And so um, then he says, however, these individuals would also point out that the majority text differs in a number of places from the Greek text that was used um, by the King James Version translators, a text that becomes known as the Texas Receptus or TR. Others would support the TR over against the majority text, often for reasons derived from theology and practice more than from manuscripts themselves. So in the foot, footnote, he's got a prime example is provided by Zane Hodges in Arthur Farstead, the Greek New Testament, um, 1985 and so basically if you're a majority text person you're a King James only so that's the thing I don't think a lot of people have actually gone through James White's book properly and I know this is held up by nearly everyone who is against the King James it's like why are you why don't you go with the TR it's like James White you know but I mean the first one are just like people who like the KJV. The second one, a major James Snap, he would be a, a King James onlyist. Hodges and Faster, they're King James onlyist. So basically, what James White is doing, he's saying anyone who's not a critical text person is a King James onlyist. <laughs> so if you don't agree with his critical text, you're a cultist, you're a heretic, and so. Um, then you have received text only. See, he makes a distinction. The, the second one, I might make myself bigger here. Where am I? Actually, I can just go there. So the second one is, or well, the first, you know, it's hard to read that for myself. But, yeah, the textual argument is the second one. The third one is received text only. So what's the textual argument of this one? Majority text. And so majority text, then the next one's received text only. That would be like, you know, Jeff Riddle and what, where I thought I was until, you know, I'm like, oh, it's the, they've gone with the, the King James. And so just pointing out that, yeah, the reading, I choose the readings of the King James. And then you've got, you know, he goes into the inspired uh, King James group. And then the last one, the King James Version, is a new revelation, which, you know, I don't even know. I don't think I've ever met anyone who believes that. Um, and so, and I've, I've often heard, like, even with um, Timothy Berg's, you know, um, frequent, um, how would you say it, frequent arguments uh, made or frequent misconceptions made about the King James Version, Timothy Berg is sort of like, um, you know, these these are some of the arguments that are against the King James, and it's like I'm looking through them going, I've never heard that. It's not a frequent argument. It's like it's like when people say, oh, people think the King James floated down on a cloud. Who? <laughs> Who? It's just, you know, it's just no one. And so, um, okay, so there are two Van Cleeks and two books. Um, one is exegetical grounding and the other is a philosophical grounding. Okay, so that's good to know. Um, and, yeah, that would be good to go through those. And these would be books um, more leaning towards the confessional bibliology um, type of guys. Um, Doki Doki Bible Club. Hi, Nick, I really enjoyed your debate at um, Standing for Truth. So if you don't know, I just had a debate on if you type in Nick Sayers, um, C.J. Cox, you'll see a debate that I recently did with C.J. Cox. Um, in all honesty, I thought it was going to be a little bit harder than it was. I mean, uh, the main topic that I've been focusing on for like 20 years is Easter. And um, I wrote an article, um, Why We Should Not Pass Over Easter, in 2005. Um, that was put in answers in uh, Genesis. They, they ran with uh, some of that material. 
um, back in the day, um, continuing earnestly for the faith. They put it in their magazine and it became quite popular. I made a few videos on it. And um, I guess I'm sort of like halfway through writing a book on it, which is, you know, it's just this perpetual thing in the background that just keeps growing. But, and so CJ Cox wanted to talk about Easter. I'm just like, it, it's like talking about, um, you know, the Westminster Confession of Faith with Jeff Riddle. I mean, this is something that I know a lot about, the, the Easter issue and why it's in the King James. And so I was I was a bit shocked that CJ sort of went there. And I guess when I do a debate, I'm I'm doing my homework. Like, so I've got to debate another guy. Um, actually, it might be... I'll have a look at my email and I'll put it up there. Uh, so there's another guy who... Uh, I'm debating pretty soon, actually. You know? Sorry about this. No yeah, so there's another guy I'm debating pretty soon. And so what I'm doing is going through all of his material and just I'll, you know, listen to or watch, you know, most of his um debates or interviews and all the rest of it and like say with rob Rowe, i probably went through about 20 of his um long-winded uh videos some of them go for 11 hours and i'm just there like chugging through all this stuff but just so i can get those little snippets of information that are like oh he believes this and he thinks that and you know so that way i'm not um shocked when the, when the debate comes but i sort of found that cj didn't really know that much about me um but maybe there's a lot about me now that um it can be hard to get information because if i guess if i look on my channel um yeah if they were to look on my channel they would probably <clears throat> see a whole bunch of stuff and so this is a guy called um uh eddie croom he's got brutefacts.com and so i'm going to be debating him uh, i think it's in about three weeks time so anyway i just thought i'd show you that so um that's who i'm going to be debating i'll get my page back up here oops and i'll jump back into the stream and I'll put up StreamYard. So that's, if you want to join us, um, just type that in. In the StreamYard, you can come up as another bobbing head here. Or uh, sometimes you can just pick a picture um, or, or just a nothing. And if you just want to chat, if you find the whole, you know, just chatting in the, um, in the comments here a bit uh, tiresome, I'll just... Look at what Helge said here. Helge said, your debate on standing for truth was excellent. You did very good. I really enjoyed that debate, but really it was more of an intelligent discussion on the part of both participants. Yeah, so I'd done the Easter issue, and I noticed that recently CJ had been going through um, and looking at... Uh, different festivals and so he had come to the conclusion that easter wasn't pagan and then understood like the quarter decimal controversy and a few other things so we could sort of talk on that level but at the end of the day i mean if he just went th I, I don't think he even went through my video on that like why we should not pass over easter um where i think if he'd gone through that he would have brought he wouldn't have mentioned a lot of because he was saying things and I'm just sort of correcting him. And, and it was just sort of like we were both both basically had the same information there. But at the end, there's got to be a conclusion. And he was sort of concluding that the King James guys just yeah, blundered. And then when Cherubim, he brought up Cherubim, which I'd, I'd answered that before, I'm pretty sure, in a debate where um, you have like the word ninja in Japanese. That can be plural. But um, we have adopted that into our language and we might say that 10 ninjas that's plural or one ninja is singular um so we've adopted a word and we've put our own um 
our own grammatical rules upon it. So that's what happens with cherubim. They become cherubims for plural in English. It's not Hebrew. We're not, you know, we're translating. We're not transliterating. And then what was the other one? It was churches in uh, Acts 19. And so I gave it a defense for that, just saying how there was basically one temple of Diana, but there were many churches in that place because for three years the, ch um, the churches had been operating there. And, um, you know, Paul had um, planted churches there. And, yeah, so that... that it, I, I recommend um, people go to that debate. If you just type in CJ Cox and Nick Sayers debate, it'll come up. Or if you just go to Standing for Truth, uh, it should be there in uh, the recent debates. So, um, Doki Doki Bible Club says, I need to brush, brush up my KJV apologetics. Uh, when I defend the Trinity in a live chat, even Trinity... Trinity Christians lock arms with oneness people and come against 1 John 5, 7. And it's funny because um, this is the sort of thing where critical text people like James White and and uh, Stephen Boyce, they say, oh, no, modalists, they want that in as well. And so they defend it, you know, and, and where here you're saying the exact opposite. <laughs> it, it's like, you know, Trinity Christians um, lock arms with oneness people. And so I'll, I just actually want to show you something that I saw. I put it on the Texas Receptors Academy. <clears throat> and you only have to watch a couple of minutes of it. And it's just disgusting because you just, I'm there, I'm thinking, man, I wish I was there. Like, and in a calm fashion, I, I was, I, I was able to, um, you know, talk to these people because I'll just get this up. Texas. Academy. Okay. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So check this out. drag that back here so obviously <clears throat> you can see these this muslim guys just quoting mesca and ermin and then just saying there's um there's a whole bunch of issues with one john five seven and if you watch that clip through he makes basically the same point that um james white makes and so these guys they just watch debates with you know james white or they read you know some of the 
um, books on text criticism and they just parrot them and they look like they know what they're talking about. And the thing is, you know, this, uh, this Christian guy who's, um, he's probably a great guy. He's probably, you know, out, um, you know, this, this guy here, he's probably out, you know, on the front line, you know, preaching to people. And, you know, he's, still, he's some of these interactions uh, here in the UK at this um, preacher's speaker's corner, they can get quite um, heated and people can um, get bashed and all sorts of things can happen. But it's like um, this guy has a point. He's saying Christians are saying the text is corrupted. And then he goes on to point out that even just the name, um, the the um, orthodox corruption of scripture, you know, it's these um, or even the one that Bruce Metzger wrote. I can't remember what the first one is, but the second one is corruption and restoration of the the text. And so, but when I listen to this guy, it sounds like a great guy, but he just doesn't have the bullets to to sort of. Um, defend and so he's saying all well, Bart says there's no doctrines affected I mean um it, it's just so it's so sad to watch this because yeah James White has become their standard and yeah uh, Dan Wallace and and even to the point where they they were so glad that someone like uh, Bart Ehrman said oh there's no doctrines affected that it's like oh whew, we can use that against the the Muslims and against the you know whoever is coming against the, the word of God, we can use th that. And so um, it's quite sad. And so I wrote um, here, the damage textual criticism ha has caused for Christian apologetics is immeasurable. So here we have just one example of people just on the street, just chatting about things. A Muslim guy just points out, well, there's been corruption. You guys have had the wrong Bible all this time. And this guy, this Christian here, if he believes the mainstream Christian narrative would have to say yes. In England, we've had the wrong Bible. But then it's like, oh, no doctrines changed, you know, sort of thing. It's like, but imagine if if that was on the other foot, if we were to turn around and say, okay, well, um, yeah, the Quran is, um, oh, no teachings changed, but you guys have you know, thousands of errors in, in it. And now you've only just fixed it up recently. That that would be huge, but and so it seems like people aren't really putting everything into perspective, and unfortunately, uh, apologists are just learning about you know how to like I, I you know I've had a few offers for debates and people have pulled out, and by apologists, and I think they realise that they're in a bit of an echo chamber. They're told that this is being this issue is. They need to know about textual criticism. They need to, you know, defend Metzger and defend, you know, the critical texts and, and all that. And that's going to help their apologetic. But it's actually one of the weakest points of their apologetic. When I listen to James White and when he's getting questioned about the comma, I mean, people are like, well, so for the last, you know, 500 years where we've had the comma yeah, in the Greek and in the English and other Bibles, so that's wrong. And he's just like, oh, Codex Monfortianus. And he goes through this whole thing and usually says, you know, six anecdotes about Erasmus that have all been disproven. But, um, and it's like, where are you going with this, James? Like, he, he has to admit that, yeah, it's wrong. And these guys are now saying that the last 12 verses of Mark are apocryphal. James White said they're Gnostic. It's a Gnostic reading. But then he's turned around and said that basically if they found manuscripts that were like, you know, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus of that sort of caliber and they had, you know, the last 12 verses of Mark and proved that that was in there, he would he would go with the reading. So he would go with Gnostic readings if they found older manuscripts with these Gnostic readings in it. It's so strange. Um, and I'm watching, you know, the Tyndale house guys, they're sort of like, well, you know, we, we can go with the last 12 verses of Mark. The Prick of Bad Ultra, I'd definitely throw it in the bin, you know. And it's just like, who are these people and how, how much have they studied? And um, it just seems like everyone's just making up their own Bible as they go, and it, it's really disappointing. Um, okay, so we have someone on Facebook saying, keep up the good work, Nick. So thanks for that encouragement. Um, Doki Doki Bible Club says, Final authority of scripture is being related 
to what non-believers permit. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so if, um, and even Tommy Wasserman has said that, um, I might actually type in, stir a few things up. Hello, De Soto. Um, text and translation dot org. So if you want some really good information, um oh, actually that's the new site. That's the new site. So I should, maybe I should just keep this one open. Um okay. But maybe I won't find. Here you go. Heterodox quotes. <laughs> cool. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, here we go. We do not, this is uh, Dan Wallace. We do not have now in our critical Greek text or any translations. So in, in our Greek, um, critical Greek texts, so same plural, or any translations, exactly what the authors of the New Testament wrote. So we don't have that. Even if we did, we would not know it. There are many, many places in which the text of the New Testament is uncertain. Wow. I mean, they're trading, you know, truth for uh, certainty. Um, you know, that's what we're apparently doing. These guys are just uncertain of where the Bible is. They have no idea where the Bible is. And so um, that was a quote by Dan Wallace. So that's a myth, some mistakes. So that's in the preface there. Um, let's see what else they've got. Dan Wallace. I don't hold to the doctrine of preservation. That doctrine, first formulated in Westminster Confession in 1646, has a poor biblical base. I do not think that the doctrine is defensible, either exegetically or empirically. Um, as Bruce Metzger, Metzger was fond of saying, it is neither wise nor safe to hold to doctrines that are not taught in Scripture. So preservation is gone. <laughs> it's so strange. Um Okay, what other quotes have we got? Dirk uh, Yonkin. I do not believe that God is under any obligation to preserve every detail of Scripture for us. Okay, so where hasn't he done that? And where has he done that? Or well, I guess you've got to ask the gurus. And um, So, yeah, very good point. The final authority of Scripture is... Um, is being related to what non-believers permit. And that was the quote I was looking for, actually. Um, so it should be young, textless, and reformed. Here we are. Young, textless, and reformed. <clears throat> um, okay, I'll just type in... Oh, what's it? Actually, I probably don't need to find that quote. I should just say it because it's pretty easy. He basically just said you don't have to be a Christian to do textual criticism. You just have to be trained in textual criticism to be a text critic. And so, you know, being a Christian doesn't mean anything um, to these guys. So you can be an atheist, you can be Muslim, you can be a Mormon, and you'll come up with um, good, um, good material that they can work with. Um, Doki Doki Bible Club says is being regulated. Oh, yeah. So, um, what he said here the final authority of scripture is being re regulated to what um, non believers permit. And so, um, that's a very good point. Um, yeah. So then he's written that again because he knew I'd put it up there. Um, one second. 
Yep, that's fine. So, yeah, if any of you guys want to join with what I'm saying, because, um, yeah, just go to StreamYard.com. And so I might even show you how easy this is. Okay, StreamYard. I hope in StreamYard, it's already there. This is my little thing. So this is saying that I'm live here already. This was just the first test that I did. Um, and when yours comes up, yeah, it's that would be hard. Maybe I can do it on my phone. Um, actually, that'll be just rubber trailing too far. But yeah, then you end up um, just following the prompts. Then you can enter into the studio and so that's using uh the same camera i guess and so uh, and then you enter the studio and you just come up as a bobbing head here so if you do want to join if you want to have a chat uh, or if you want to say something uh or if you're against what i'm saying you might be a critical text person you feel like i'm misrepresenting everyone and or you might be a majority text person or whatever. Um, we are into truth. We are into uh, defending the Bible. And this program is about the King James Version being a final uh, authority uh, and the underlying text of the King James Version, that Greek text, is the final edition of the TR. So that would just clearly answer um, uh, Mark Ward's concepts uh, James White's concepts. Um, I don't think these guys have actually even addressed any of that. So, um, all right. So I'm just thinking of what else I can go through. How long have we gone for? Two hours. I think I'll probably go for maybe another hour. Um, I'm just trying to think of what else I can do. Maybe what I could do is show you around my website. Okay, so here I am at the front page of my website. Okay, so that's a uh, hundred there. Explaining what the Texas Receptus is. <clears throat> um, I've got the quote from Hills here in the corner there. And... A whole bunch of links now i don't necessarily agree with everyone with these links it's like say young earth creationism um you know i, I don't know what hardly what ken ham believes on on some things but it's like i still you know promote his stuff to go okay go there for a good article um, against evolution um so we've got quite a lot of links there um if you want to um no, like so. Basically, my website has twenty three thousand three hundred and fifty two articles. Okay, so some of them are very small, some of them are very large. Now, if you go down, you can see you know, there's a bunch of languages there. Some of them I've done a lot of work on. Some of them I haven't, and so. But you can go through, say, to. Um, uh, We'll go to Second John chapter one. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to make this nice and big so you can see it because you don't want you squinting. Okay, so the the English is coded to Strong's, and so we've coded all those in. So if you were to look at, you know, say Christ, it would take you there. Christos, um, and so also I'm working on a project which is scriptures containing um, Christos, and so uh, and I'm trying to put all the Strong's numbers in there as well. So obviously here it sort of ends, but it will still give you where they are, and so um, yeah, that get, just goes down to Revelation. So if you're doing a study on Christ or, you know, uh, any type of word in the Greek, it'll show you exactly where it is and how it's translated. So that will be a powerful tool once that's completed. Um, and also this is just like a, 
just to sort of bog standard like a stub if you go to um say if i was to go to um matthew one So what I have first is Theodore Bezos, 1598 here. Biblos, Christu, you are David, you are Abraham. So I have the 1900 Pure, Cam Pure Cambridge edition there of the King James and then the 2016 edition of the New Testament um, is, and that's what I've worked on. So this is one of the things people say, oh, you're a King James onlyist, but I've actually, in 2016, I did an update of the King James. And most King James, like hyper King James only is don't like that. Um, and I have to say hyper, you know, because it's like there, there are all those distinctions that James White made, and, but then there are these other distinctions. And so, um, but that's why I've put it all side by side. And if you actually go to this website, kjv.org.au, you um, a good friend of mine uh, who runs Texas Receptus Bibles, he's put in, um, so we got parallel Bibles. So you can compare the side by side, um, the 1900 to the 2016. And so, and that's what I wanted. I wanted people to be able to go through and check. And so, you know, I've put, put in things like, um, you know, punctuation and things like that. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the standard spelling, Emmanuel, um, the older style of Emmanuel uh, is in the 1900. And so just things like that. Um, most of the time it's exactly identical. There might be a bit of capital, capitalization in the King James, sort of like that's in the middle of um, a, sen you know, a sentence that has a capitalization because it goes to the next verse and things like that, which I don't have. Um, but on a whole, when you check through that, you can see any changes that I've made. And so, um, so that's the thing. And that, that's why people are like, oh, you're a King James only. And it's a war. How many, how many King James only do you know who have actually updated? So this is the thing. Mark Ward's like, oh, you know, why don't they just do an edition where they've updated the archaic words? It's like, I've already done that, Mark. Like this was before, way before, you know, Mark Ward sort of came on the scene. So I've already done it, but he just won't acknowledge it. And he just says things like, oh, any work that's done by a single translator is always bad. And it's like, um, okay, that's a good way of uh, getting around um, looking at it. So anyway, on, yeah, on the website. So if you go to any one of these verses, usually it's got the, the text of Beza. Now, sometimes I have the text of Scrivener up there and I actually, if it's got, if it's all coded, then it's, um, it's exactly what Beza has because I've checked it with the actual document. If it's just sort of um, like black and not coded, that means that it would be the text of Scrivener because it's a work in pro progress. And so, um so yeah so with using my site there's there's so much information like um say with matthew one this you can you know check these the 1611 here 1900 here the 2016 here and um you know parts of speech what case tense number gender etc um the strongest numbers you can go through all them and so you might want to look at you know viv loss um and so a lot of this stuff is what I've done myself and just going through material and gleaning stuff from other books and, um, you know, showing where, like, the Bishop's Bible has, this is the book. And I've actually enlarged this so you guys can read it, but it is a lot more readable if I make it smaller. It's the lists are better. You know, Tyndale Bible, what it has, what the Texas Receptus, you know, the um, how it's inflected. 
and some of the different languages there's, there's still a, so much that, more that i could put there but um you know i'm just one person going through this and so that's how you would view like those strongs numbers so yeah this is coded to strongs and so that's what we want with every word now some of these words you click on it and it's it's not as good as that it's a half-baked project i'll go to look to okay so blepo um i haven't got all the stuff that's usually on the bottom there so that needs to change um but yeah i've got basically the words are all there but still haven't got the thing at the bottom what is the thing at the bottom i'll just show you it's basically this helpful links a whole bunch of links that goes through you know confessional bibliology king james bible research council sky of zion versions compared with sky of zion a whole bunch of stuff then internal links these are some of the more popular ones that people would look for um you know why we should not pass over easter that's a big one there um scrivener's uh 191 variations and then we have like a list of papyri so if you want to know about p23 you can click on that one <clears throat> and just as i was saying there's zero about <laughs> about that one so let's go to p9 okay so that's the thing sometimes you go there and it's nothing there but at least you know the more that i try see there's nothing there as well so if i go to p1 the papyrus is one that i haven't really worked much on all the rest of them are usually there okay so p1 so we have you know um what p1 is we have a picture of it description and then we have you know what's written down in p1 and so we can uh look at all that and then we have uh according to hoskier you know what he has there and so um then the history of this and then so i also put in um a whole bunch of stuff written about this so uh you can you can go and check that out you know exactly what um grenfell and hunt wrote about it and um their take on it and the nominus sacra etc so that's all on my site um if anyone wants to help edit this page just contact uh, or this website contact me most of the minuscules have been done so let's just check out a random one 430 here <clears throat> okay so minuscule 430 so it's 11th century um it's in the bavarian state library so it just gives a little bit of info and some people at Aylands looked at it casper renee gregory scrivener um and so yeah and then after the minuscules was it the minuscules yeah and then we have uh young shules so we might look at say 15 and sort of that okay so they're just a redirect somewhere so obviously all wherever it's red it has to be done and some of the blue ones are um, they need to be done too so yeah it just gives you a understanding of what's there um etc and then down the bottom uh lectionaries so still a lot of work to do with all that and that's my book revelation 16 5 b's is the expansion of the rare gnomon sacrum form of jehovah and i am in the final triadic declaration so this is basically like i'm trying to make it like wikipedia but for um trying to make it like wikipedia but for just tr kjv issues okay so let's look at what's being said here uh docky the docky bible club says i can't join at work uh, if you copy and paste that stream yard link into the chat box, it makes it easier to click and join. Okay, so I'll just um, oops, I'll just uh, here we go. Let's click the YouTube. That's where most people are, I think. Um,
Yeah, so some of these pages have a lot of info. So usually I've got that type of info um, down the bottom in the internal links. So say like Revelation 16.5, um, it's just lots and lots of info. Like I was showing you with Matthew 1.1, it's all coded to the Strongs, um, and then um, you know, an interlinear type of thing. Uh, and then I start going through the issues, like, oh, Lord, um, or Curios in the Greek, uh, where this appears in uh, the Latin, um, in its uh, curia, in its nomina sacra form, and... Usually what I do is I try to get a picture of it as well. So that way people can, um, you know, I'll try to put it in text form. But so that way they don't have to look it up themselves. And also I'll have a link to it where I found it. So that way if you're doing homework on any of these verses, sometimes it's, it's so much easier just to go through what I've done. So, you know, I've typed this one in with the funny little letters and everything. Um that's sort of you know what it says there and put the you know nomina sacra lines there and underlined it which looks a bit weird because it's nomina sacra above and that's underlined below but um yeah so then minuscule um two three four four that has uh curie there so and the thing is you know nomina sacra is it's difficult because it sometimes can just be regulated to you know two letters which can drop out quite easy um english bible so it's interesting the coverdale bible they had lord all the way through the new testament you know so i understand the jehovah's witnesses they want to put jehovah wherever they think it's lord um and so then we're looking at the ethiopic um lord there it's in the ethiopic but then we see, like, you know, in Psalm 119, uh, verse 137, it actually sort of almost verbatim quotes Revelation 16.5. So we have, um, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. Where Psalm 119, 137 has, Righteous art thou, O Lord, and so that would be Jehovah. The expansion of Jehovah is, and wast and uh, sorry, which art and wast and shall be that means Jehovah and upright are thy judgments. And so we see, um, in verse seven, it says, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And so, it, this is a quotation of Psalm 119, verse 137. So, it's quite interesting. This is Elijah, um, Elijah Hutter's, um, he did a uh, a Hebrew Bible, and so he also did a Greek parallel with that, and so we can see um, where these words, dikaios a kudia ki, well k, um, it's hard to read that. Um, yeah, I know that's su at the end, but. It's hard to read uh, that type of uh, writing. But here we have, it's interesting in the, yeah, so what I do is the similarities in Greek. I've got it, um, got them here. So, dikaios a kyrie kai ethes a krisisu. And so we see that the word Lord, that's an expansion of Jehovah, all of that. So if we just take that for Lord, it's basically um, sort of exactly the same, except, you know, that's around the different way with the E there. And then we see verse 7, uh, it's saying, Ne curie hothius hopetokrator. And so it's uh, Lord, uh, the God, the Almighty. Um Alethinai, so that's um, true, kai uh, dikai, so true and righteous uh, are your judgments. So, um, prisisu. So, you can see where that's uh, written here, this, the exact same words. And so, it's quite interesting. And we see in the Latin, it's quite interesting as well. 
And so, yeah, this is the sort of information where, you know, sometimes I'll just go down a rabbit hole and start studying something and end up with a page with all sorts of info, copy and pasted stuff, stuff from, you know, other Bible sites, some sites that have shut down over the years and I can find it on Wayback Machine. And um, like Will Kinney, he was saying, where can I find the Elzeva's uh, 1633 text? And so, well, it's on my site. You can just check that out and it has um, uh, QDA there and it has S. Somenos here. So um, that's in the Elzeva's 1633 so this is just to give you a bit of an idea of what's on my site. You know, the, the Staten Vertling, uh, the Dutch Bible, uh, they has had who will be or who shall be the equivalent. Um, so there's quite a lot of information. We've got Isaac Newton. He was quoting it. Uh, Esomenos saying it came from Beza from an ancient manuscript. Um, Wettstein, um, he said it came from uh, Piscator, but it, it comes from Erasmus. I haven't found anything that points to Piscator, but he, in his 1613, it actually was in there. Um, okay, so do you have resources on Westcott and Hort? Not really. Um, I guess I have links to Westcott and Hort resources. So if you if you click on the TR logo here it takes you to the home page so it's just an easy sort of way of just getting back and navigating now obviously i've got this on like where are we i've got this on 250 so you know it would be a lot different for most other monitors but it's just so you can read it so here i have books just in the corner here um and if you go to books down the side here, if you click on any of those, it'll take you to ERARA or Hathi Trust uh, editions of these Texas Receptus um, Bibles. So if you want to look at uh, 1582, you can click on that, open it up, and you'll end up you know, with the with it right in front of you. So this is a really good way of um, you know checking the TR editions and, and all the rest of it and um, you know, going through their readings. Let's just jump on a random page here. <clears throat> so there's, it's a great resource if you, you know. So here you have um, Theodore Beza's text, you have the Greek here, you have the, his Latin translation, and then you have the Vulgate. Uh, you might have a marginal note or a little bit of info on the side, and then down the bottom or sometimes at the top, you have, you know, say verse 9 here says, this in Latin, this in Greek, and then it has a Latin commentary, sometimes going back to Hebrew, etc. Oh, yeah, that's Hosanna. It's just quite interesting because Hosanna in the King James is actually um, all in italics. Well, that's one of the things when I was going through italics, when I was going through the 2016 edition, I'm like, well, which italics do I follow? The, the 1900 ones? And there's still some places in the King James which I don't think italics are warranted where it says um, God is love in 1 John, I think it's chapter 3 or might be might be chapter 4, but it has it in italics and the New King James actually deletes those words. But when I looked at Beza's text, they're in there. And so they actually deleted them thinking that they weren't in the original Greek text. So they mightn't be in Scribner's, uh, sorry, in uh, Stephanus's, but they're definitely in Beza's. And so I thought that was quite weird. But anyway, so Hosanna here, in the original King James is in italics and they put the italics there for emphasis because they're yelling out Hosanna and so it's quite interesting and I guess that maybe it was a song too Hosanna to the son of David it, maybe it was like they were all singing it or shouting it or whatever and, and so it's quite quite interesting you know um, they're the sort of things that I would love to go through and so this is just a random page I pulled up here so just so you can see you know people are like oh where do you get that info about Beza's text well you just this and this is just like a bible if you if you just navigate through it um you see it's chapter um 22 um it doesn't say where you're at but usually you can sort of gather it's in matthew and so you can 
go straight to the source, looking at zooming in on things and see what I really want is for my website to have all this in my website. So it's got all, all this documentation, but, you know, um, going through the, um, going through the copyright issues can be a pretty big thing. So uh, Helge Evanson says your TR site is fantastic. Best resource ever. Yeah. Thanks for that. I've been working on it since 2008. So it's been quite a long time. There's been, you know, I tend to start things, start a page and get really bored with it. Because if you're spending two hours on something, you're like, man, I just want to go to something else. And but um, so I've got a lot of things that have started. And um, I guess when I first started the page, I actually thought that everyone in my TR circles, which was thousands and thousands of people, I think it was like 5,000 people on my um, Texas Receptors Facebook um, page that used to be really um, quite hot and you know, a whole bunch of different people on there. And, and uh, I thought that if I made that page and I put the information there, people would want to go there and people would want to add to it and um, and work work through those things. But I just found that no one was really interested, unless I actually pay people to do stuff on there, which I have done quite a fair bit. Um, people just aren't interested in, in putting information up there, I guess. Um, you know, some King James only people don't like me, some TR people don't like me, think I'm too much of a King James onlyist or whatever. And it's like, oh well. But um yeah, so we've put in lots of things. So this this book section is basically um yeah, you can go through and look at, you know, the uh Colin's Bible, covered our Bible, um, a whole bunch of stuff. And so, you know, the original King James, but then I've got a whole bunch of books too. So you can look at, you know, Frederick Nolan's, um, you know, and like I said, not all books are recommended, but it's simply made available. Um, the revision revised, uh, forever settled unholy hands on God's holy word. I'd recommend people just go through these and, and there's, there's so much, you know, new age Bible versions by Gower. You can see what she said in her own words. Um, Herman Hostia concerning the text of the apocalypse. Um, yeah, some anti TR pages, but there's some good material there. Um, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of stuff there. So that's in the books. Um, so I'll just put up that link again. That's the StreamYard one if you want to join. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess over the years I've had different portals and different ideas of like, you know, having an online dictionary and all that. And then other websites have come along and sort of answered that because this is quite, quite an old website now. And so in the links, you've got like... Um, like, say, like the King's Bible... This is by Keith Mason. So he has down the bottom, like the King's Bible, Black Letter, King James Bible, the Webster's Dictionary. So he has that, uh, the King James Bible Dictionary, which is really amazing, actually. Texas Receptus Bibles, Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, John Gill's Exposition of the Bible. So just even just those links going through, they're invaluable. Um, yeah, Texas Receptus Bibles, great website. Um really good information there and you know he's put my one up there the 2016 so you can compare that with everything else that's there as well that's at the top of the list you can go down there and you can check out tr editions and uh variations and things like that so yeah very interesting very interesting so that's just one of the links um, like even KJV Asia, a lot of people don't know about this website, a whole bunch of material. Um, modern versionist surgeon, uh, maybe it's Spurgeon, surgeon. Um, James Price's indisputable error in the King James Bible. So yeah, a whole bunch of, um, okay. So he's saying Isaiah 13, 15, it's an indisputable error blah 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 so they've got an article on that and so 
and it's good that people are just sort of choosing random things here and there and um and doing articles on it so they actually they've got a heap of really good articles actually um very interesting and there's a whole bunch of articles there so yeah that that's interesting um what else have we got? Will Kinney's page. I recommend anyone doing any type of study into the um, issues of text. They just need to go to Will Kinney's page, go to King James Bible articles. I'll just expand that a bit. And usually he's written something on it, on wherever you're at. So just say we are to go to um, you know, Hosea 3.1, flagons of wine or raisin cakes. Um, and so, you know, he'll tell you, usually it's a bit like with everything else. Um, like, like I was saying with uh, Ripplinger's books or, you know, even like the one I've got here, the serious omissions in the NIV Bible, um, like this guy's got a whole bunch of lists that are very helpful. Like, uh, I was using this the other day in my, um, my debate, you know, the NASV omissions that the NIV corrected to agree with the King James Version. And so it's just a quick list. And so it's very helpful. But then he has um, he has things like, oh, when the translators lost their voice on the Ankerberg show and all this, and it's like, what? what? That's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And, and so, um, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't necessarily agree with, you know, Gary Ripplinger's stuff, Ruckman's stuff, but it's like sometimes they have a list of stuff or they make a comment and it's like, yeah, that's true. Just like I wouldn't agree with every young earth creationist out there. We would have our differences, but on the whole premise, there is agreement. And so with Will Kinney, there's not much we don't agree on. I mean, Will's a Calvinist and I'm not, um, but Will um, definitely... Uh, he does have a little bit of um, Bible numerics where it's sort of like, you know, if things add up to seven, you know, and uh, and all that sort of stuff, and then it's from God. And, you know, if this appears in the King James Version seven times, and that's a special code for it should be of God and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, okay, well, I understand um, Bullinger. He used to be the main guy of the Trinitarian Bible Society. He was pretty um, wild with some of the, his things that he was claiming were errors in the King James. But um, but Bullinger, he um, he wrote a book on Bible numbers, and it's, it's interesting, you know, gives you an interesting perspective. So I wouldn't agree with that with Will, and sometimes uh, Will will have his own little thing to say, but then he just goes straight into, okay, well, what does it say here? In the context, he underlines it, and he capitalizes it, and he just shows you, context and then he will show you what dan wallace says and what these other bibles say and look here we have the the nasb esv jehovah's witnesses new world translation holman say raisin cakes the niv has love sacred love the sacred raisin cakes the bible in basic english has they are lovers of grape cakes ancient root uh, translinear bible of 2008 has love nut cakes and grapes the douay reams has they love the husks of grapes Mm, yummy <laughs> so it's just things like that he's got his own little commentary there you know and sometimes it's, it's classic you know um and love the seeds of grapes always been one of my wife's favorite delicacies <laughs> the seeds of grapes it's just disgusting um <laughs> and offered them choice gifts um so the new living translation just omits the phrase and says even if the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them it's like uh yeah so anyway once you go through his it's a bit like going through a wikipedia article but way more accurate um he'll just show you what john calvin says adam clark you know a whole bunch of people and once you've gone through his article you are pretty much educated on both sides you will see what uh, will thinks about it and um yeah to me this is an invaluable resource and and 
I guess in a way um, I point to pe I point people to this website all the time, even though some people don't like Will Kinney. Uh, you know, James White definitely when he talked to him on, on his radio program once just went totally unhinged uh, when Will was like, "Okay, so where's the Bible?" He's like, "Ah," and just just threw sand and dust in the air and just carried on like an idiot and um, just called him a cultist and that was it. Um, okay, so what are some of the other websites here? Um, okay. Yeah, the Dean Bergland Society. I mean, they have so much information. Um, and... I mean, seriously, even just going through, um, or here you can just look for, where are we? Uh, timely articles or video sermons. Or down the bottom here, King James Bible or critical text. So if we want to look at biblical history, so they've got, you know, four or five, set so five articles on that. Westcott and Hort's text and theory refuted. I was actually, yeah, someone asked me about Westcott and Hort, and that's why I came here. Um, I sort of rabbit trailed, but what I was actually looking for. So, yeah, that's DA Waite. He's got his own article on Westcott and Hort and all the rest of it. Um, and some of this material is just gold. Um, you know, the testimony of Herma Hoskia, the printed text of Westcott and Hort has been accepted as a true text and grammar's, Work on the synoptic problem, works on high criticism, and others have been grounded on this text. So it's uh, Hoskia, uh, Greenlee, D.A. Carson, Pickering. And so these guys are just basically saying, you know, that the critical text is the Westcott and Hort text, because that was a big thing back in the day. People were separating themselves from Westcott and Hort. Now they've got the um, Tyndale House text, they can do that. They say, oh, no, we go back to Tregellis, not Westcott and Hort. It's like, okay. But what's interesting is I was actually reading the introduction to the um, the United Bible Society text. And um, where am I? It was quite interesting. I might just read this uh, for you. <clears throat> Sorry about my cough there. Got a bit of a morning um, breath happening. Okay, so let's. I guess when you've been talking for like nearly three hours, you start getting a bit croaky, which is why I've got water here. And if anyone else wants to join, you can um, you can say whatever you want, have a chat, promote your website, promote your ministry, do whatever you want. Um, Doki Doki Bible Club said, "What brand of laundry detergent to use for blessed are those who wash their robes?" Um, non KJV versions. Revelation twenty two fourteen. I'll just go there. Revelation. Um, oh, yeah. Where the King James has, blessed are those who do his commandments. Where the other ones have, blessed are they who wash their robes. So I'll just show you. And this is another good site. Skyon of Zion. Now, I might actually... I usually have a link here. Go back. This page here shows you how many he, he got. He's got 700 or something places. So you go through the New Testament. I mean, if you're going through and studying Acts and you can go through these, click on Acts 241, it'll show you all they've admitted gladly. Then they... Then they received, uh, they that received his word were baptized. But here it has, and they, 
they that gladly received his word were baptized. So it's omitted. Why is it omitted? And so he'll he'll give you he'll give you that information down the bottom. So I'm pretty sure um, this the guy who was running this site has recently passed away, like in the last year or so. But his site's still up. Um, some really good info. But yeah, if we go to um, Revelation, what was it, twenty two fourteen? It has here. Um, blessed are they that do his commandments, but the other ones say, blessed are those who wash their robes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, good point. So, yeah, wh I wonder how they're washing their robes. I guess um, they're using, uh, you yeah, know, sard or um, yeah, they've got to be white. So I guess they're bleaching them, bleaching their robes to stay righteous, you know, instead of the righteousness of Christ, it's sort of their own righteousness. Um Maybe it's Ruckman. He's get the get the blackout, you know, a racist type of thing. But um, where are we? Okay, now I've totally lost thought of where I was. That's because that wasn't up there. That was down here. So we were looking at Westcott and Hort and some material on that. So, yeah. He's got some interesting things there. And this is the sort of thing that needs to be looked at, studied over and over and thought about. And, I mean, there's so much really good information in DA Waits material that I think he's just been demonised by people like Mark Ward. I mean, they just hate anyone who's a leader of any type of TR, KJV movement. So... Um, If you don't like the new versions, don't worry, they will change. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and that's the thing, you know, that the Greek text is changing too. You know, we're going to have the CBGM. It's going to be finalized by, you know, um, 2032. We're going to have the real Bible apparently. So I guess we'll throw out the other ones. And um, But we don't want to become Bible tribalists, what Mark Ward talks about. And so we don't want to favor just one Bible. We've got to have multiple Bibles, even if they say the op exact opposite thing because then we're accepted by him and his guys. And so then we're not heretics. We're having one Bible. We're going to have many Bibles. It's like having many gods, you know, just, just in case. You get the real reading in there somewhere. Um, okay, so what was I looking at? Westcott and Hort. If I actually type in Westcott, yeah. Westcott and Hort, and I go search. This article by Phil Stringer. And so this was in 2001. That's 20 years old. There might have been a few things that he might chop and change a little bit. But he's got quite a lot of good information here, you know, when they were born. And um, there is actually a website, which is probably why I was looking at books. That's why I was guided to books and ended up rabbit trailing. So go back to the books. Maybe. Um, Westcott and Hort books. Here we go. Um, so you can look at what all that they wrote. So it's good to get um, good source documents. Okay, so this is westcottandhort.com or westcotthort.com, um, a, a resource center. So let's get this blown up a bit. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, biographies, bookshelf, articles, New Testament bookshop, bookshop links about this site so you've got quite a lot of info here so this would be um i don't i think these guys are favorable to westcott and Hort, but it's that's fine sometimes um oh yeah a study in king james these are oh yeah doug kudelek westcott and Hort versus texas receptus which is superior um 
so Qtilac is like sort of, you know, Dan Wallace, James White, but a bit on steroids. Um, so I guess that's the thing. Some people have made accusations against Westcott and Hort that are that are not, um, you know, that correct. But the thing is, then they throw everything out, and that's what I find is like. You know, like James White will just wait until some really kooky guy says what's become popular on the internet, and then it's like, oh, well, he's saying it, so it must be wrong. It's sort of thing. It's like, well, um, what about how about we just deal with Westcott and Hort? They, on their revision committee, they had Unitarians working there. How about we deal with that first? George Vance Smith was a Unitarian, didn't believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he wrote a book about how the doctrines are changed in the Greek text because of the the emission of God was manifest in the flesh and how he's very happy about that. Um, and so that would be a starting place and then we work from there because to me that's just, that writes these guys off almost completely that they're hanging around a guy who's probably worse than the Jehovah's Witness and he's working on their text. I mean, and, uh, you know, if we were to go back to... Um, you know, the Dean Bergon Society uh, literature, we can see where um, obviously, well, I won't go there, but obviously Westcott and Hort, um, their text is the base text for uh, all the critical texts. But, so let's open, oh yeah, so you've got re revision revised here. Um, Hort, six lectures on the... Um, Anti-Nicene Fathers, I think it says. <clears throat> Very cool. So it's the actual book, which is what you want. And you can copy and paste it. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, all that's, you know, you can find that if you go through my site. Um Heaps of material, heaps of really cool links, even like God's secretaries. Uh, why are you showing me that? Yeah, the whole book, God's secretaries. Well, maybe it's not the whole book. Maybe it is. Adam Nicholson. So I remember reading this. There's some good, some bad. It's sort of, you know, the whole King James with the homosexual thing and the translators were drunks. It looks like it's got the whole thing in there. So that's, you know, you can read through that. And, and like, in all honesty, anyone wanting to look up anything to do with texture criticism, just go to pdfdrive.com. <clears throat> and you know if you type in textual criticism bang brill books a whole bunch of things i mean i've found yeah the na28 in a pdf online just there it's like that's what i was looking at just on my phone before i've got it on my phone the whole na28 um which i was actually going to read something from there which i found quite interesting listen to this in 1898 eberhard nestle or nestle i've got to start calling him nestle because that's how, how it's pronounced i call him nestle Eberhard Nestle published the first edition of his no Novum Testamentum Graeca. Based on a simple yet ingenious idea, it disseminated the insights of the textual criticism of that time through a hand edition designed for university and school students for church and for church purposes. 
uh, Nestle took the three leading scholarly editions of the Greek New Testament at the time by Tischendorf, Westcott and Hort, and Weymouth as a basis. After 1901, he replaced the latter with Bernhard Wiese's 1894-1900 uh, edition, where the textual decisions differed from um, each other, Nestle chose for his own text the variant which was preferred by two of the editions included, while the variant of the third was put into the apparatus. So you notice what Nestle did. He just got Tischendorf, Westcott and Hort and Weymouth. Where they agreed, he would go with that reading. If two of them agreed, he would go with that reading. So if three of them agreed to go with the reading, two of them agreed they go in the reading. If there was a difference, he would point it out in the margin. Um, and so that's how the Nestle, Nestle, I should say, text started. The textual, the text critic apparatus remained rudimentary in all the editions published by Eberhard Nestle, Nestle. A primary apparatus displayed as witnesses only only the editions mentioned above, while a second apparatus initially contained only readings from Codex Bize. Subsequently, evidence from other important manuscripts was added. Uh, it was Eberhard Nestle's son, Erwin, who provided the 13th edition in 1927 with a consistent critical apparatus showing evidence from manuscripts early translations and patristic citations. Now the Nestle um, met the standards of scholarly hand edition of the Greek New Testament. However, these notes did not derive from the primary sources, but only from editions um, above all that of von Sodden. Uh, this changed in the 1950s when Kurt uh, Alan started working for the edition by checking the apparatus entries against the Greek manuscripts and editions of the church fathers. This phase came to a close in 1963 when the 25th edition of the Novum Testamentum Greece appeared. Um, later printings of this edition already uh, carried the name Nestle Alan in, on their covers. Uh, the 26th edition, which appeared in 1979, featured a fundamentally new approach. Until then, the guiding principle, with very rare exceptions, had been to adopt the text supported by a majority of the critical text editions referred to. Uh, now the text was established on the basis of source material that had been assembled and evaluated in the intervening period. Uh, it included early papyri, and other manuscript discoveries, so that the 26th uh, edition represented the situation of textual criticism in the 20th century. The text was identical to that of the third edition of the UBS Greek New Testament, published in 1975, as a consequence um, of the parallel work done on both editions. Already in 1955, uh, Kurt Alan was invited to participate in the editorial committee with Matthew Black, Bruce M. Metzger, Alan Whitgren, and at first Arthur Vubus and later Carlo Martini. And from 1982, Barbara Aland and Johannes Kara Vidopoulos uh, to produce a reliable handwritten Greek New Testament for the specific needs of Bible translators. So I'm just, re this is the NA28 introduction. So it's quite interesting that at first there was the Tischendorf, Westcott and Hort and Weymouth. So they were the main ones got, that they went to. So it's interesting that um, someone, I think it was, um, it could have been David Cloud or Kurt DeVitro that actually wrote to Bruce Metzger and says, how did you start your um, your Bible text? Um, you know, what did you start with? And they said, well, we went with Westcott and Hort that we got their text first and then we changed things from there. So it's interesting, you know, someone like James White will say that we are, um, we kind of 
you know, TR people don't have a, a methodology and, you know, our methodology is all over the place. One minute we're saying 1057 should be in there because of internal evidence and, and grammatical issues. The next minute we're saying we go with a majority text. And, you know, he makes up stuff all the time and says that we, that's our methodology. But look at these guys. You know, they've gone through all these texts and then Westcott and Hort have this different methodology and then you, they're amalgamating these three texts of uh, the Weymouth, the Westcott and Hort and the Tischendorf. And then um, later on, they're abandoning that in the 1970s and they're going with this other method. But then later on, they're going with, um, you know, the orthodox corruption concept where, um, you know, the Byzantine guys, and I know they did this in some places, but not all places, um, you know, where there's um, expansion of, of um piety and deity and things like that where it would, might say the lord jesus christ where it just says jesus christ and things like that but they say oh it happened everywhere you know it's like and that is usually you know people who don't know much about it and they learn that rule they just keep parroting that and it's like um yeah sometimes that does appear sometimes you do have you know say revelation chapter one verse eight you might have you know god there and things like that but it's like um it's definitely not in the text but and it makes you know jesus it's like jesus is god you know sort of thing but it's like we don't want to have these expansions we we are against those as well but the critical text is like okay we don't want anything that looks like it's making jesus deity and so um and so yeah at the end of the day um yeah so i was I, I sort of said all that just to basically say that you can find anything online. I've found that online. Um, you can get this studies in textual criticism of the New Testament. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. And once you click on one thing, um, so say this one's on the coherence-based genealogical method by Gary and Wasserman. Uh, similar books appear down the bottom. Let's get rid of that rubbish and that rubbish. And so, yeah, as you can see, this is this is quite interesting. Um, Helge Evanson says, uh, Dirk Youngkin was on Dwayne Green's channel earlier today, yesterday, and it was interesting to see how weak he was on preservation but that is a critical text position. They cannot be strong on preservation. And that's so true. That is um, unfortunately the way that the academy raise up their disciples. You've got to be weak on preservation because um, it's the, it's preserved somewhere. In, in the, amongst all the manuscripts, it's there somewhere. So the more information we have, the more closely we can probably get to, you know, the, the original. But we're still going to have errors, you know. Doki Doki Bible Club says, um, I'd see why people would want to distance themselves from Westcott and Hort in their own writings. Uh, in, in their own writings comes come things like calling the atonement an immoral doctrine, divinity of man, evolution in Genesis, etc. So, yeah, that's um, that's interesting. And that's where... I guess there have been uh, there has been a little bit of overreach with quoting Westcott and Horton, and so that's why it would be good to um, have some good source material. So I know um, someone like Phil Stringer, he's pretty good with his studies, and so that's why I pointed to that one on my website. But um, apart from that, I'd go to the Westcott and Horton, their own page, and read what they said for themselves. Um, and uh, D.A. Waite seems pretty good too. And so that most of the guys in Dean Bergen Society are pretty good. Um, if anyone, Helge Evanson, if anyone does not have a settled text, one's preservation becomes weak. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't know where to find the words of God, you're, you're going to be trying to find them somewhere in the Septuagint or a different manuscript or if a new finding happens, papyri, that turns up, it's like, well... You're going to have to um, find the words of God somewhere or just admit that you don't have all the words of God. And so it's quite a strange concept. And you have to overlook all the scriptures that say, 
you know, do not add or take aught from it. You know, aught is, uh, it's, um, old, you know, old English, it's in italics, but it's it's a, it's to do with counting, you know, it's an, it's an accounting term. Uh, every word, every letter, every everything makes a difference, you know. When it's saying jot or tittle, I understand that the ultimate um, context of that is Jesus fulfills every part of the law. But it's like, well, you have to have every part of the law there for Jesus to fulfill, the, every jot and every tittle. So it's talking about letters. It's talking about the the, the smallest, the, the yod is a very small letter, the tittle, the tiniest part of a letter. And so, um, you know, these things are, are preserved so that Jesus can fulfill the law, you know. And um, I think I think there's just a... Uh, it would be good to do a whole program on that, actually, rather than rabbit trailing down there. Um, so Doki Doki Bible Club says, good point at held uh, Everson. So uh, talking about the, um, yeah, they cannot be strong on preservation. So, yeah, preservation, I mean, why would God inspire the words of God for them just to be lost? It just seems so ridiculous. It's, um, it's 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 bizarre. It is absolutely bizarre. I mean, usually when God creates something, um, he it lasts forever. If he says it's last going to last forever, it does. You know, he's like sun and moon and stars will last for this long, and you know, these things will be you know, last for, you know, so long. And even future prophecy, it talks about dates and times and seasons and all things that are going to happen. And But we can't even trust God on, you know, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall by no means pass away. He's talking about words. He's not talking about doctrines. It doesn't say my doctrine shall by no means pass away. And the thing is, how can you separate words from doctrine? It's impossible to do. It's like separating words from the Constitution, you know, you've got the Constitution of, of the United States. It's made up of specific words that are used in a specific context. Um, how can you just turn around and just say, well, you know, we, we don't go with the words. We go with the spirit of the Constitution. It's like, no, we, we go by the words, you know. Um, I'm sure that insurance companies over the years have been, you know, they've regretted wording things in a certain way or some people have signed a document and they thought a word meant something when it didn't. And um, but words are very important when it comes down to it. It comes down to the word. Jesus said we will be judged by his words, not by his doctrine. It's by his words that will be judged. Um, it's, it talks about people who hate his words. If you hate me and my words on that day, I, I think it says. Um, but anyway, so any one of these books, so all you have to do, so say like this Brill one is probably worth, you know, it's, oh, it's by Barton. It's just amazing how he is just, he is like the, um, he's got his tentacles in everything. He's like the octopus. Uh, in in the academy with these tentacles all the way through it, and people are like, you know, becoming apologists to come against Bart Ehrman. They're, they're actually part of him. They, they, they don't realise that they're using his arguments, they're using Metzger's arguments that turned him into a, you know, fully-blown agnostic atheist. Um, anyway, let's check this out. So we can download that for free. Okay, so it says download. Uh, I don't want to add to Chrome. Oh, actually, that was a pop-up. <laughs> I was getting carried away with it. Okay, so this is what usually comes up. I think on my phone, it doesn't have that pop-up come up. Okay, so it's downloading. And there we go. We've got the book right there. Some Bart Ehrman book that goes for 417 pages.
Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, people are like, you know, where, where can we get these books? And, I mean, seriously, most of it's online. I don't even really buy books anymore. Like, I, I don't, I've got tons of books about TR and all that. Most of these are, are pre-internet. Most of the books I have behind me are pre-internet, or they're so rare that you can't get them online. Um, I've even gone through some things, and I know they're online, or I've got them PDF, and I'm like, why am I bothering with the paperback that I haven't touched for 10 years, and I've just, you know, gotten rid of it? Um, you know, give it down the bookshop or give it to people. Um, because it's, it's like, why am I constantly having boxes and boxes of books just so I can show people I've got it? It's like, well, if I'm really going to study it, I study in PDF and online. And so anyway, I've gone for three hours and I'm sort of running out of things to chat about. Um, what I might do is next week I might make it a a full proper um, topic. Like this is just sort of a general, you know, TR topic, history of the TR um, issue. Maybe what I'll do is I'll talk about, um, you know, something like, I think I've done one on one jump five, seven, but maybe we'll do one on, um, you know, Codex Sinaiticus or um, I'll find something through the week. I'll think about it and it'll be something that's, pretty full on and um yeah thanks for joining guys um i don't want to be you know like subscribe blah 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 in every video because it really sort of it, it annoys me when i'm listening to something and they're like ring the bell do this do that but i guess people have to you know say that sort of stuff to get their page promoted but ultimately <clears throat> anyone listening to this if you like the stuff that i'm saying go and subscribe to jeff riddle subscribe to taylor de soto subscribe to my one and like the videos like sometimes i just go through jeff riddle stuff and i just go click 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 and just like like all of his videos because it's like that just helps him get up in the search engines rather than having tommy wasserman up there or you know, some other, you know, Bart Ehrman's head, you can have Jeff Riddle, you know, popping up in people's feed and then he just gets more popular, TR gets more popular and people realise there is a, an intelligent apologetic for the TR and uh, King James Version. So thanks, Doki Doki Bible Club, um, for the many resources. Yeah, cool. And so there was another one that I found recently pdf drive what what was it it was yeah it was a real weird one and it just had so many books um pdf books it was really good i on my um screen you can't actually see um this is uh, how many whoops I'll turn that off. This is how many books I just downloaded the other day. <laughs> like heaps of Westcott and Hort stuff, Burgon stuff. Um, yeah, a whole bunch. Of, I just I just I just got carried away. I was just like, Let's, I'm just downloading this and downloading that. And but it's good to have it on. I've got hard drives just full of PDFs. Um, even like Norton's uh, textual history of the King James Bible. Um, there it is. It's online. The whole thing. You can see what he he says. I know Brian Ross is going through some of his stuff. Um, yeah, you can you can check it out for yourself and what he's saying. So it's all that I've yeah. I searched for it, found it. There it is. So anyway, I'm going to let this um, live stream stop because I've gone for about three hours. Oops. Don't need that. Where are we? Now I've lost my spot. Okay, here we are. 
Um, so Helge says, thanks, Nick. Um, this is very informative and educating and edifying as always. So I guess in a way I didn't really have much of a topic. I'm just sort of just shooting from the hip with this and reading a few things here and there. But, um, yeah, if anyone wants to interact or if you know people who are like against the King James or against the critical text or, you know, if you're on talking terms with some of these guys like Mark Ward or uh, Tommy Wasserman or Peter Go, you know, invite them to come along and say, look, he'll talk to you. We can even host debates on this channel. Uh, we can do anything. And so um, I really appreciate you guys uh, joining in. I'm going to leave it there. Um, but, yeah, and if you've got any ideas of what to do a show on, uh, let me know and um, we'll we'll chat about it maybe just contact me on Facebook or something like that or, or just leave the comments on the video. All right, cheers, guys. I'm going to end it right there. All right, thank you.